Assalamu alaikum, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, we're pleased to speak to Brother Jamie Turner. How are you, Akhi Jamie? Alhamdulillah, I'm very good. How are you doing? Pretty well, pretty well, alhamdulillah. Jamie Turner is a doctoral student in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. His primary research areas are in philosophy of religion, epistemology, and Islamic theology. He is the author of several scholarly articles and book chapters. His doctoral research consists of an exploration into the thought of the Islamic theologian Ibn Taymiyyah and his approach toward doing natural theology. Jamie has also acted as a referee for a number of academic journals, including Religious Studies, Faith and Philosophy, Sophia, and the European Journal for Philosophy of Religion. Today, Jamie is going to be offering us an exposition of Ibn Taymiyyah's Fitra-based epistemology. This will then be followed by a detailed rational defense of it. Now, I must alert our listeners that this is an exceptionally philosophically dense presentation compared to most of what you have seen on blogging theology. So listening to this while, while multitasking isn't advised, if you desire to digest most of this presentation. Now, with that born in mind, Brother Jamie, please feel free to begin. Thank you very much. You know, I was hoping that you might say you're most welcome, sir, but I suppose... Uh, no, that's, 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 that's Paul's thing. That's Paul's thing. That's just Paul's thing. <laughs> All right. Very good. Bismillah. So can, are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Okay, lovely. Okay, so yeah, thanks very much, uh, Baslam, for introducing the topic. Obviously, um, the topic in general is religious epistemology. So we're interested in, in looking at um, how it might be possible um, to know that, that God exists. Specifically, we'll be focusing on the existence of God in particular. And as you rightly suggest, I'll be um, referring to this very specific theologian within Islamic history, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. So, as a as a, oops, sorry, as a brief overview, um, the presentation will be divided roughly into these three parts. So, uh, first, I want to introduce some important, key, and fundamental epistemological concepts, um, such as what knowledge is in general and what a belief is, and um, Thereafter, I'll be looking at Ibn Taymiyyah's religious epistemology in particular, and then looking at some potential objections um, to his religious epistemology and what we might say in response. So let's begin then with a quick overview of epistemology, and in particular, the concept of um, knowledge. So in general, I want to to suggest that knowledge can be understood as a kind of success or achievement that we credit to somebody for exercising a kind of skill. So in other words, knowledge is a kind of success for having gotten a true belief that we credit to somebody for exercising a kind of skill. So that's what I take knowledge to be in general, but it'd be helpful for us to just focus on the specific puzzles of the jigsaw, um, if you like, um, pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, I should say. So to begin with, let's imagine um, a teacher is, is in his classroom and uh, students have just been uh, given a test or a quiz that our teacher has marked. And so the teacher is reporting back to the students the correct answers to the questions in the quiz. And he also knows all of the, the answers that the students have, have given because let's say that he, um, he's marked them. Suppose he reads out that the answer to question five is 36. And one of the students in the classroom says, oh, I knew that, I knew that. And let's suppose that our student actually put in the quiz 24, not 36. Could we take seriously his claim that he actually knew that the answer was 36, even though he'd written an answer that suggests he didn't even believe it? 
Probably not. We couldn't credit him with having gotten that right answer or that true belief if he didn't even believe it. So the starting point for knowledge is that someone has to possess a belief. If you know something, you have to believe the thing in question. All right, good. So we've got belief. Suppose also that another student in the class um, suggests that, um, that they knew the answer as well, um, being 36. And suppose, like our other student, they didn't get the right answer and, they, and they'd written that it was 30. Um, once again, we probably couldn't credit this student with having knowing the answer because they didn't actually get the right answer. They, they, they came up with an answer that's false. So we couldn't credit them with having gotten something right if they'd actually written something that was contrary to the truth. So the reason why they don't know in this case is because their answer just wasn't true. So roughly then, to begin with, if somebody knows something, the very least we need is that they believe it, they actually hold it to be true, and that that belief is true as well. Um, I couldn't credit our student with having gotten a true belief if his belief um, wasn't even true. So he wouldn't know in that case. What's needed is, 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 is perhaps something extra though. Suppose now that we have another individual, um, and let's use a different example. Suppose somebody believes that Manchester United um, are going to lose a football match, 5-0, um, not 7-0 like they lost um, the other day, which I was very happy about. But suppose that they're going to lose 5-0, our friend thinks. And suppose um, they're playing a team quite low down in the leagues um, in football. But that person just has a strong premonition or sense that Manchester United are going to lose the match 5-0. Suppose it turns out that they actually did lose 5-0. So in this case, our friend believes that Manchester United are going to lose 5-0. It's true that they lost. But would we attribute knowledge to this individual? Would we be able to credit them with the success or achievement of knowledge? Because, I mean, they did get a true belief, of course. But it seems that they were just quite lucky to have gotten a true belief in this case. Um, it was just a matter of luck or happenstance that Manchester United happened to lose against a team everybody would have expected them to beat. So what was missing in this case was not belief or truth, but some grounds or evidence or reasons. Our friend in this case lacked justification, we might say, for his belief. So roughly then, one might think, that perhaps knowledge requires belief, truth, and justification, some evidence or reason or ground. And if we have all of those components together, we can credit somebody with having gotten a true belief because it was based on the grounds or reasons or experiences that they, that they have themselves. However, there's also a problem here. One might have belief, truth, and justification and lack knowledge even in this case. Consider um, an elderly man. Um, and let me just give an example prior to this, this example that I want to give. Let, let's suppose we have an elderly man and um, he has some wind chimes hanging on the door outside of his um, kitchen door. And whenever the wind blows, the wind chimes chime. And, um, and our elderly man, he knows that. So when he walks into the kitchen one day, he hears the wind chimes chiming. And so he forms a belief that it must be windy outside. Um, in this case, let's say that it's true, uh, that it's really windy, and he believes that. And I think he's probably got justification because he hears the wind chimes chiming. So that seems like he's got a justified true belief. Now let's change the example slightly and suppose that we return to our old man a few years down the line and he's suffering from some kind of cognitive malfunction or disorder or something. And he suffers from these kind of auditory hallucinations as a result of his malfunctioning. So that sometimes when he walks into his kitchen, he hears the wind chimes chiming, even though they're not chiming at all. He's just having these auditory hallucinations. Suppose one day he walks into his kitchen and um, he has one of these auditory hallucinations and he hears the wind chimes chiming. 
Suppose, though, his wind chimes outside, of, there's something wrong with them. They're not working. They're not chiming at all. But let's also suppose that it really is windy outside. So our, our old man, he believes that on the basis of his auditory hallucination, because he hears wind chimes, that it's windy outside. So he has a belief. It is actually windy outside. It's true. And he sort of does have some justification. I mean, he does have the experience of hearing the wind chimes chiming. But in this case, we wouldn't be able to attribute knowledge to this elderly fellow because it was as a result of a malfunction. Or in other words, just luck. It was just lucky that his faculties happened to have been malfunctioning in that kind of way at the time. And this malfunctioning is not aimed at truth. It just happens randomly. We wouldn't be able to credit him with, a true, with, with, with knowledge in this case. So justified true belief is a helpful way to think about what knowledge is, but it's not a sufficient way to think about what knowledge actually is. And I think a more helpful way to thinking about what knowledge is uh, is the following. And that is that where somebody knows something, we want to say that they know just in case their belief is produced by a certain kind of intellectual skill or virtue or ability. I'm thinking here along the lines of accurate perception, reliable memory, sound and valid reasoning. When somebody exercises and uses these virtues, they can know something. The reason why, or part of the reason why, is because those virtues and skills are actually skills that guarantee something to be true. They make it true when you exercise um, these virtues. My perception, if it's accurate, gives me true beliefs about my things in my external environment. So having auditory hallucinations, that's not going to give me true beliefs very often. So a helpful analogy to think about this, just to draw the point home and, 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 and bring this to a close, is to think again of, of maybe another couple of sporting examples. Suppose in football, um, Cristiano Ronaldo or Messi is taking a free kick and they... Um, they successfully convert the free kick. They hit the ball over the wall. It flies into the top corner. They have achieved a form of success. What is the success or achievement? A goal. They, they happen to have scored a goal. Um, now, can we credit that success and achievement to Ronaldo or Messi or whoever took the free kick? Yes, we can because they took it and the skill that they exercised was such that it brought about the result the achievement, the success. Suppose another example, we have somebody who, again, let's say Messi or Ronaldo, takes a shot from outside of the penalty area and it was going miles away. He was never going to hit the target. And suppose it hits a defender and it bounces off the defender and it goes into the net. A form of success has been achieved. But do we credit that success or achievement to Ronaldo or Messi? No, we don't. Rather, we would say that that's an own goal. Um, we don't credit to, it to Ronaldo or Messi and say that they scored a goal. Rather, we, we credit it to somebody else, um, the defender who it hit off, because that success of achieving a goal was not a result of their skill or virtue. Okay, final example. Let's imagine an archer. And our archer is a professional archer. And... He has a target, and his target is the bullseye, and he successfully fires the arrow, and it hits, boom, um, into the bullseye. Once again, we can credit that, um, that success to him. Now, of course, if we had another archer who uh, wasn't professional and happened to fire an arrow, which, again, was missing the target, but a gust of wind blew it on course and delivered it to the target, we couldn't credit that success to, to, to this amateur archer, let's say, because it was just a matter of luck. Now, consider that a belief is an arrow and that truth is our target. 
when our faculties are working properly, when we believe something, say I believe that there's a laptop in front of me, that's my arrow. And I fire it to, at the truth. My faculties fire it towards truth. And when those perceptual factors are reliable and they're working properly, we can credit that belief, hitting the truth, that successful catching of true belief to me, to my faculties. And in that case, um, because my faculties were primed to really hit the target um, reliably and well, I can know in that case. So this is, this is important to, to get our heads around, this idea that a belief can be knowledge for somebody if it's produced by a kind of skill when we turn towards Ibn Taymiyyah, because we want to consider whether we have a kind of skill or faculty whereby if it is working properly, we can actually form um, true beliefs about God. The other thing to say here, um, and I'll just add these little picks in, that's our the target with the R in to remind us of what we're thinking of here. But the other thing to say here is that some of our beliefs we call basic and other beliefs we call non-basic. Um, and this is also going to be a crucial distinction for us. So suppose I have a belief, um, I hear the doorbell ringing. Um, now, when I hear the, the doorbell ringing, that just sort of happens upon me immediately and I form that belief immediately. I'm almost forced to have the belief. I can't, I can't really help it. Um, my, my hearing just picks it up and it's primed to do so. But suppose I form another belief in addition to that, that because the doorbell is rung, somebody's probably at the door. That second belief isn't a basic belief, isn't like an initial kind of base belief. That belief is inferred from the first belief that there was some, the, 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 the doorbell rang. Similarly, suppose again, another football example, you're on the bus and a lot of football fans come on with, with uh, football shirts and scarves. Just having the belief that, that, that people are wearing red shirts and scarves is a basic belief that you have immediately. Forming another belief, say that, oh, they're probably going to the football match this weekend. That second belief um, is non-basic. It's based on our first kind of belief. And so when somebody offers arguments, for instance, in philosophy, um, when somebody offers an argument, they're, they're going through an inference. They're inferring from different uh, things that we believe. Whereas when somebody has a basic belief, they're not arguing. When I believe that there is a laptop here or a cup there or um, that there is a sound here, um, I'm not arguing that on the basis of, say, um, it appears to me that there's a laptop in front of me. Therefore, there's a laptop in front of me. You know, we don't go through that sort of reasoning. We just have a kind of initially simple, immediate, basic belief. But would you say that it's necessary that if you do have an, in, you know, a belief via inference, that there must be a basic belief upon which you inferred that belief? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. Just, you can't you can't have an inferred belief detached without a basic belief underpinning yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a very that's a very good point. The reason why we we well, most epistemologists would say we, we can't is because if we said that um in order to know something, um we have to have a belief from which we infer another one, then we'd have to infer another one for that one and that one and that one. So an infinite regress would ensue yeah. in that case. Yeah. Um, so that I mean, would be it has the to be inferred from something. So that yeah. something cannot be an, inf an inference itself. So it has to go back to some point. To some foundation, as they call it. If we were to say that um, in order to be justified or to know belief A has to be based on belief B and B has to be based on C and that has to be based on D, well, that'll never, that'll never end we'll never get justification or knowledge in the end. So we have to start somewhere. But what makes a distinction between, say, um, starting uh, sorry, starting somewhere and, and not being able to make that move? In other words, what makes a belief basic and another belief non-basic? Well, I think the answer to that is a little bit related to what we were just saying. It, it relates to whether we have a kind of skill or ability to acquire knowledge about something in a basic way or not. So for instance, I do seem to have 
the ability to just know in a basic way that my laptop's in front of me. I do seem to have the ability to know what I did yesterday. I do seem to have the ability to know that there are other human beings around me, other people, not just robots, but beings with minds. Can you describe basic to- beliefs as effortless beliefs imposed upon you? Or um, is that not you fully could, you, you, you could, and in the sense that many of our basic beliefs might be like that, but I wouldn't want to say that entirely because I think as we're going to see in a few slides later, you can have a belief that's basic, but it's actually based on reflection. Um, in other words, it's not inferred, but it's based on just reflecting about different things and then winding up with a belief after that reflection is over. But what I wanted to say is that I seem to be able to know certain things in a basic way. But for instance, if I was to say that, well, it just seems to me that next Tuesday is going to be pouring down, you know, I don't seem to to have a skill or ability that can just give me that kind of knowledge without me going out and, and checking or asking the weather forecast man or, or whatever. Likewise, if somebody, say, has, has, if a few people have been accused of committing a crime, let's just call them Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, four different people, and, um, and suppose that I just have this strong sense that it must be Matthew or rather John. John's the one that's committed the crime. Um, Well, I just, I don't think I have the skill or the ability to know that without checking the evidence, the whereabouts of these people, fingerprints, where the stolen item ended up, the means and motives that these people have. But by contrast, things like what I see in front of me, what I can hear, what I remember, among other things, I just seem to have the ability and the skill um, to know these things in a basic way. So the question, well, one of the questions is going to be, do we have a kind of theistic sort of faculty or skill that we could exercise to know God in, in a basic way? Um, now, anyway, so that's epistemology 101. Well, it's not really epistemology 101, but it's the concept of knowledge um, and belief, let's say, 101. Um now, before moving on to Ibn Taymiyyah's epistemology and his religious epistemology, we need to say something more about religious epistemology in general. I mean, we've taken a little dive into epistemology, but here we're focusing on specifically religious epistemology. So let me just lay everything out here um, for a moment. Now, within religious epistemology, um, there are different stances or positions. And if you occupy one of these positions, you'll basically be saying something about how we can know God or how we might be justified in believing that God exists or something. And within these different positions, so here I've got theistic evidentialism, fideism, and reformed epistemology. Within these different positions, um, There are also different sort of branches and versions of them, but I'm not going to go into too much depth about all of the different branches. Um, For the purposes of of this presentation, we just need to understand them in a kind of, um, you know, basic way. So take a look at this um, objection here. It's called the evidentialist objection to theistic belief. Now, this is an objection that an atheist might, bring up against believing God. Um, And let's say that P here uh, means God exists. So S knows that P, that God exists, if and only if it's based on a good argument, but there is no good argument that God exists. Therefore, our person here, S, does not know that P. Now, typically, people have responded to this objection by denying premise two, that there is no good argument for God's existence. And people who have done that are often what we call theistic evidentialists. Theistic evidentialists are those who say that, yes, if we do possess knowledge or justified belief in God, 
Um, it has to be based on evidence. And by evidence, in this case, they mean usually arguments based on what we call propositional evidence in epistemology, but for now we can just think of them as arguments. So they actually affirm premise one. They say, yeah, it is true that S only knows that God exists if they have a good argument. But the thing is, Mr. Atheist, we've got a boatload of good arguments for you. We've got different cosmological arguments, teleological, ontological, moral arguments, arguments from consciousness and so forth. So they just sort of wheel out these arguments and therefore they get past this objection. But others take different, take a different route, let's say. Um, now, fideism um, is, is a, it's kind of, it's kind of a funny view because there are different branches of fideism such that one branch of fideism can actually allow for theistic evidentialism as, as part of its sort of positioning, whereas others can't. Um, I don't, necessarily want to touch on on those that branch but if, if you're interested we, we can say something i just want to take a look at how fideism might be radically different to theistic evidentialism so a fideist might be someone who says that actually um this whole question of of evidence and knowledge and justification concerning the existence of god is just wrong-headed um rather Believing in God is something like um, a moral commitment. We, we make a kind of moral commitment to this being um, for pragmatic or practical reasons, maybe because it makes us um, a better person, maybe because amongst other options, say naturalism, Platonism, theism, theism just seems to, to make more sense for me in my life Maybe somebody takes Pascal's wager and says, you know, I haven't got a great deal of evidence, but look, if God exists, you know, things are going to turn out well for me. If he doesn't, I'm in big trouble. So they kind of make that move. And so they would respond to this objection, perhaps by saying, you know, the whole thing is just wrongheaded from, 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 from the start. God isn't like um, a kind of proposition that we prove or something. Now, the final view here, reformed epistemology, is different, particularly from theistic evidentialism, um, because instead of attacking premise two by saying that we've got good arguments that God exists, reformed epistemologists deny premise one, and they say, um, actually, somebody can know that God exists, even if they don't have a good argument for God's existence. So the reformed epistemologist attacks premise one, and the theistic evidentialist typically attacks premise two, and the fideist might just say, well, you know, this whole argument just puts us on the wrong plane when it comes to thinking about God. Reformed epistemology seems to me to be um, the view that aligns best with Ibn Taymiyyah's own view of religious epistemology. Because as we're going to see, Ibn Taymiyyah makes it quite clear that somebody can know Allah's existence, even if they don't engage in, say, philosophical reasoning or argumentation. And, um, and so, in a sense, when we're looking at Ibn Taymiyyah's epistemology, at least religious epistemology, in my view, we're kind of looking at a version of reformed epistemology. Now, before I move on, I should say that, as I suggested, fideism can overlap with theistic evidentialism and even reformed epistemology. Reformed epistemology can even overlap with theistic, theistic evidentialism. I'm just kind of putting this in as a, as a preface or qualification. It's not that relevant for our concerns, but a lot hangs on what you consider evidence to be. So, for, for instance, if an experience or a seeming, say, is a piece of evidence, say, it seems to me that the laptop's in front of me and that's a piece of evidence, um, then, then actually you can be a reformed epistemologist because you can say, well, yeah, you have a piece of evidence and you're justified, say, in believing God 
uh, believing that God exists because it really seems to you that he does without having an argument. And at the same time, you're a theistic evidentialist because you think that seemings and experiences are pieces of evidence too. So you can kind of square them together. But typically, Reformed epistemology and theistic evidentialism are concerned with whether or not good arguments are required. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, I mean, the Reformed epistemologist could also believe, but he could also attack premise two in addition to premise one. Like he might, yeah. he could also believe. No, look, there are really good arguments for God's existence. However, the point I want to stress is, is that they are not necessarily required for a justification in believing mm -hmm. in God. While the theistic evidentialist would say, no, actually, they are required, and that's and that's why we insist that they're there. So, yeah. so oh, I mean, the reform so I mean, the reform epistemologist could agree with the theistic evidentialist that, of course, there are good arguments for God's existence. But we part ways when we say that it they are necessary for ha for having a justified belief in God. Would that be an accurate Very, summary? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I also think the Reformed epistemologists might say, and we'll maybe touch on this right towards the end of the presentation, that theistic arguments, arguments for God's existence, they are not necessary, and they might not even be sufficient. They're not sufficient to know God. In other words, the arguments for God's existence, they raise the probability that God exists quite well, but they're not sufficient for knowledge because as per our introduction to knowledge, knowledge requires that it's uh, that our beliefs produced by a kind of skill that sort of guarantees um, that that belief hits the target of truth. Mm -hmm. If it only probabilizes it, then um, then that's not going to get you knowledge as well. So that's something to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. And finally, about fideism, um, I wasn't going to mention this, but you know, oh well, let's just chuck it in there. Um, a fideist could say that actually, evidence of sorts is in play when it comes to forming our beliefs about God, and they could even say that evidence is necessary, um, but that in order to access that evidence, you need to have a kind of um, a certain spiritual disposition, or you need to have a kind of faith in order to even apprehend the evidence. And probably they would be thinking of evidence more broadly than, than arguments, but that would situate them also as affirming um, theistic evidentialism as well, in a sense. So, yeah. All right. So, as I suggested, we are going to be looking at Ibn Taymiyyah and focusing on what I take to be Ibn Taymiyyah's account of Reformed epistemology, this idea that we can know God even in the absence of, of arguments. But um, who was Ibn Taymiyyah? So, Ibn Taymiyyah, in brief, he was born in Haran, which is in modern-day Turkey. And as a result of the Mongolian invasion of that region at his time, he uh, migrated as a young boy with his family to Syria, as we would call it today. And he ended up staying in Syria until his death, um, rahimahullah ta'ala, and he died in Damascus. Um, the year 1328 CE. Um, now, Mitamia basically is situated jurisprudentially and theologically within what we call the Hanbali school, um, which sort of harkens back to um, Ahmed ibn, ibn Hanbal. Um, and he, he belonged to a family of, of Hanbalis. His father and his grandfather were, were Hanbali jurists. Um, and so he was sort of, you know, socially uh, and, and familiarly immersed into that tradition. Um, one might also refer to him as an ethari or as a kind of scripturalist in his approach to theology for two reasons. One, because Hanbalis in general took that approach um, to doing theology, that, that scripture in a sense is the starting point um, 
and in another sense, the end point of all theological pursuit. And so what we, we, we can know and understand about God is ultimately what scripture informs us of God. Um, and I also think one could say that he was an ethereal or scripturalist in the sense that although Ibn Taymiyyah engaged in um, Kalam, in a sense, and engaged in Falsafa, in the sense that he engaged with the works of Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, and the Mutakalimun, the Islamic um, theologians, philosophical theologians. At the same time, he didn't seek to necessarily establish his creedal positions on the basis of um, those uh, ventures into Kalam. He basically took it that what we know and what we can say and believe about God is ultimately what scripture, the Quran and the Sunnah tell us about God. And uh, at the same time, we can show how um, those views about God based in scripture are congruent with reason. And so, in a sense, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, I suppose, tried to translate the sort of traditional Hanbali Athari views into the language and framework of Kalam, even though himself, you know, he wasn't a full-fledged Mutakalim because he didn't say, for instance, we have to engage in Kalam to establish God's existence first before we can even uh, be justified in believing in Islam or something. Of course, Ibn Taymiyyah wrote um, an awful lot. Um, here are just some of his works. Darat al-Arud al-Akli wa nakal this book, which maybe in our context is the most important of, of them all, um, where he tries to avert any apparent conflict between um, reason and revelation. Um, he has works which are a critique, not necessarily of logic, but of the logic of Ibn Sina, um, the theoretical say, axioms of logic that Ibn Sina basically upheld in his Arad uh, al-Mantiqeen and Naqt al mantiq He also has a, um, a well-known work in response to Christianity, Al-Jawab al-Sahih, in, in brief, and, um, and some other works critiquing different sort of sects or schools within Islamic thought. And um, Al-Aqidat al-Wasitiyya, this, this book is perhaps familiar to, um, to many of us who have studied uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, theology uh, in brief. And Majmur al-Fatawa, this is not a book that he wrote in, in, by name, but this is a book which compiles different um, fatawa and, um, and different treatises all, all put into one. It's not exactly a compilation of fatwa per se, but it's, it's got religious rulings, verdicts, questions, theological um, expositions, philosophical considerations and the like. So Ibn Taymiyyah, you know, he's a figure that has a lot to say on so many things. Um, and so, you know, he's a very, I think, in one sense, a, a figure that, that that requires more um, exposition on concerning his views. But I'd say, thankfully, that this is starting to happen a little bit more, particularly in the Western Academy, um, than um, in decades prior to, to now. So I think that's a good thing. Although he continues to be very controversial and misunderstood. So, how's Ibn Taymiyyah? So, what about Ibn Taymiyyah's epistemology? So, how does Ibn Taymiyyah understand epistemology in general? Um, well, Ibn Taymiyyah, to begin with, he's not um, unique in um, his affirmation of the basic sources that we have um, for knowledge. Uh, theologians prior to him upheld that we have something like sense perception, his, um, aqal, and khabar as a means uh, to know. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah divides his into al-batin and al-zahir, um, which are roughly internal perception and external perception, let's say, so that we have, a, we have the ability to perceive our thoughts and our feelings and feeling hungry or feeling happy. Likewise, I can perceive things in front of me in my external environment. Um, we also have the ability to know things through reason. Ibn Taymiyyah thought that reason um, did at least a couple of things. One of the things that reason did, uh, does, sorry, is to generate concepts. 
So when we observe various different things using his sense perception, we um, we start to observe various different particulars and reason abstracts from those particulars, a concept, like a universal concept, which unites them together in some sense. And also reason allows us to make inferences as well, or istidlal. If I, for instance, witness some uh, smoke, I can infer from that that there is probably fire. Um, that would be a, a, an example of having a dalil, which is an indicant, a madlul, a thing being indicated, and istidlal is bringing those two things together. Ibn Taymiyyah also thought that we can know things by way of uh, khabar, by way of testimony as well. And um, important for Ibn Taymiyyah is his affirmation that there are, um, well, again, this is not unique to Ibn Taymiyyah, but there is khabar, which is ahad, which is singular, and there is al-akhbar al-matawatir, there is uh, multiple reliable testimonial reports. And that second class of testimony is really important because Ibn Taymiyyah thought that, like some other Islamic theologians, that it w- it's not rational to kind of deny um, reports where so many people have reliably uh, narrated or reported about it. Yeah, but in a nutshell, then, these are the basic sources of knowledge, although there is there are a few more, and we'll turn to them, in a sense, uh, in the next bullet point following this one. So if those are some of the basic sources of, of, of knowing what exists, and knowing things about ourselves and others in the world, um, Ibn Taymiyyah brings, in a sense, all of our faculties together in this centerpiece, which is referred to as fitrah. So fitrah, the concept of fitrah, first and foremost, is not unique to Ibn Taymiyyah because it's in the Qur'an. You know, we have this 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 verse in the Qur'an, um, part of it, which, which says, فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا that there is this basic, this fitrah, um, which God has fashioned all of human beings on. He's created all of us on this um, this fitrah, right? This nature, which I'm going to explain in a moment. And then we also have the hadith. Uh, you know, there is a prophetic hadith uh, which, which which suggests that um, every child that is, uh, that is born is born, not except that they're born on, on fitrah. Um, so this is a Quranic and a prophetic concept. But Ibn Taymiyyah, in my view, at least, he kind of um, emboldens this concept, enriches it, because he pushes it into a, to areas, um, say, epistemology, which I don't think had, had, had been done prior to him, at least in the way that he does it and to the extent that he does it. So roughly we might think of a fitrah as this natural constitution or this natural um, state that God has created all human beings upon. If we think about um, ourselves as human beings, we all kind of share or participate in some basic common nature. We're able to identify uh, with one another as fellow human beings because we share some basic nature. Um, you know, if you're an Aristotelian, you might think that human beings are rational animals. And it's that basic nature of being a rational animal that, that makes us all the same in some sense, because we have this same sort of nature. So fitra then is this basic human nature um, that God has created as a pun. Now, I think what Ibn Taymiyyah wants to suggest with regards to the epistemology of fitrah is that fitrah is essentially um, the cognitive, um, sorry, the epistemological centerpiece of all of our um, cognitive capacities. So to give an analogy, suppose um, we think about, say, a car for, for the moment, a car. Now, a car um, has different pieces, and all of these different pieces um, are ba- basically being designed to work in a certain way. And they work, they've been designed 
to work in a certain way, given the nature of what a car is, right? So um, we, we, have a, we have a steering wheel, uh, which is connected to the wheels of the car. Um, given the nature of what a car is supposed to be, these pieces operate the way that they do, given what a car is, its nature, its basic makeup, um, let's say. Now, similarly, in a sense, I think that what Ibn Taymiyyah is suggesting when he says that, you know, he agrees with the Qur'an that we've all been created upon fitra, is that we basically also have this same basic cognitive makeup. All of us have been endowed with sense perception, with reason, with introspection, with memory, at least most of us in a basic way. And when those, um, say, parts, those cognitive parts, are working according to the way that they're supposed to work, according to um, the extent to which they're rooted in our basic nature, then we can know things um, in the world. So, for instance, um, if I was to form a belief that all my fellow human beings, their heads are made out of glass, right? Suppose that I happen to have the belief that all my fellow human beings' heads are made out of glass. Um, clearly, that belief is um, bordering on, on the insane, um, not only is you know false, it's bordering on the insane because my um, faculty of perception has not been designed in such a way to give me that that sort of belief. In fact, even if we imagine a hypothetical world or universe in which I, um, in which people really did have heads made out of glass, um, I wouldn't be able to to know it because my faculties have not been designed in such a way to give me that kind of knowledge. Our faculties have been designed in, in such a way with certain limits to give us knowledge of the world according to our nature, according to the way that, that God um, created them. And if they're working properly with respect to how they're supposed to work, given our fitra, given our basic nature, then we can know things. Um, so then the question is, I suppose, what are the different um, natural capacities that God has endowed us with to know things. If we can know things just so long as those cognitive capacities are inherently linked with our fitra, with, with which God has endowed us with, what are the things um, that God has endowed us with in terms of capacities? Well, earlier, if you remember, we talked about basic beliefs, we talked about non-basic beliefs. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah thinks we have a capacity to know various different things about the world in a basic way. And uh, obviously, I apologize, I can't give all of the references and all of the specific quotes with regards to these specific things. Um, but uh, well, I mean, we'll get to that maybe at the end. Now, some of those are, say, sensory perceptual beliefs of Intamia thinks that we can know, um, say, what's in our external environment and that we can know uh, what we're thinking and feeling in a, in a fitri way. He would call these sorts of beliefs uh, fitri daruri, that these beliefs are natural and non-inferential. Ibn Taymiyyah thinks that we can know certain, um, what are called al-badihiyat, basic self-evident logical principles, um, say the law of non-contradiction, that A cannot be B and not B at the same time. Ibn Taymiyyah thinks that we can know some metaphysical truths in a basic way, like something can't, um, something that begins to exist has, has to have a cause. Things can't come from nothing. Ibn Taymiyyah suggests that if testimony is sufficiently reliable and um, multiple, let's say, then we can know that in a basic way, in the sense that we don't need arguments. As I suggested, he thinks we can know uh, things about our mental states. He also thinks we can know certain moral principles. And um, most importantly for our interests, he thinks that we can know things about God 
in a basic way. Part of this notion of fitra is that we have this fitri theistic disposition that inclines us to know to know God. Okay, so this is very this is very beneficial. So so basically, it's not that the fitra. It's not like someone can come and say, you know, my fitra tells me that you know I am being stalked by someone, uh, and and he equates that to some gut feeling that he has. I mean, I think what Ibn Taymiyyah has in mind here are specific beliefs, so the ones that you just laid out right now, and not exactly. just not that it could just be applied to any little thing out there. So simply because you have a gut feeling, you know, I have a gut feeling that this team is going to win. You can't say. Ibn Taymiyyah is not going to say, yeah, that's your fitrah kicking in, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. it's basically, yeah, okay, very good. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, again, that relates to our earlier discussion about what makes a belief um, basic for us in the sense of um, what makes it possible to know something in a basic way and what makes it possible to have to have an argument. And, you know, I, I like I told you, I, I don't know in a basic way what the weather's going to be like based on gut feeling next Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever. I just don't have that capacity. Allah didn't create me or you, um, I don't think, with with that ability, given my fitrah, given my nature. But we might think, for theological reasons, as well as some kind of scientific reasons, that we do have a capacity to know God, to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a basic way. Mm. Now, in a nutshell, I think we might summarize this fitrah-based epistemology in terms of how we can know something um, along this, uh, along this, along these lines. I mean, to be honest, this is not in and of itself sufficient, but for our purposes, it is. So, suppose S believes that P, that God exists, or whatever it might be, that P is true, and that that belief is produced by certain cognitive powers. Kuwa or a kuwa, just one, say sense perception, um, that are part of our natural constitution, our fitra, in the sense that God has designed them and set them up in such a way that they are truth aimed and reliable, and that they're operating in the right sorts of environments. This is going to be really important um, shortly, but look, I mean, you know. My perception might be fairly accurate given the conditions I'm in now, but stick me in a dark room that's pitch black. Um, I won't be very good at identifying the objects around me. So our faculties need to be working properly in accordance with their nature, which is primed to get us truth. And we need to be in the right environments. Otherwise, they're not going to work very well. Okay. Um, the reason why this is really important is because it might relate to um, the other half of the hadith on fitra, which um, says that you know all of us have been created upon fitra, but it's our it's the parents, say the Christian parents, Jewish parents, Zoroastrian parents, which change um, the nature in some sense of an individual. Maybe um, our fitri theistic capacity, in a sense, also requires us to be in the right kind of environment for it to work well. So, given that basic sort of brief overview of Ibn Taymiyyah's understanding of how we might know something, how can we develop from that an account of religious epistemology? Um, well, I think it might look something like the following. Ibn Taymiyyah wants to suggest to us that if Islam is true, which of course he believes it is, then God created us, created us upon fitra. This is clear because it says it in the Quran. God set up signs to know him in nature. This is also a Quranic um, idea as well. And that God revealed more specific signs about him and his religion in the Quran. Indeed, we do refer to the verses of the Quran as ayat which, of course, is the Arabic for signs. So, Ibn Taymiyyah, first and foremost, just to hone in on, on A there, that God created upon the fitrah. So he's saying, look, 
God created us upon this this special kind of nature, and part of that nature um, is that it's being given cognitive abilities and capacity, capacities. And one of those capacities is to to know God. But how is that capacity sort of triggered, or how is knowledge acquired through that capacity? How is knowledge of God acquired through that capacity? Well, Ibn Taymiyyah suggests that there are different signs that God has set up. Um, in one place, he calls them ayatul fi'liyah. Um, and he says that these ayatul fi'liyah are signs that God has created um, in, the, in the horizon, al-afaq, uh, wal-anfus, in the cosmos, horizon, and in ourselves. So God has set them up. Uh, and again, this is a Quranic uh, idea um, that we have these different signs in creation. And also, he refers to what he terms ayat al which uh, are his spoken signs, the signs that he speaks, um, which are the Quranic ayat. So the idea, I suppose, um, would be that, that God created us upon fitrah, and in the right sort of circumstances, suppose, you know, you're out in nature and you're reflecting upon the beauties and wonders of, um, of creation. You reflect on the beauty of the horizon and the, the, the starlit night sky or a sunset in a summer's evening. You're looking at uh, the elegant beauty of a, of a modest flower or um, your, your own self and the like, you can come to, to knowledge of God. Why? Because God has actually created a disposition in you to know him, and that this disposition will be triggered when you encounter his signs. When you encounter his signs by perceiving them, by reflecting upon them, that basic theistic position, rooted and inherent in fitrah, when it's functioning well, will give you knowledge of God. And what's, also, what's the difference between the signs here yeah. and the arguments that evidentialists use? Because it, it would appear to the evidentialists listening to this that you're saying, okay, you know, Jamie, you're talking about signs, which we call arguments, triggering the filtra. So there's still an important um, place for arguments in this epistemology, unless signs here is something different than the arguments that evidentialists have in mind. Yeah, no, signs are, uh, are completely different to arguments because mm. suppose, for instance, um, look, I have um, perceptual faculties, right? Mm -hmm. You stick me in the right environment, say this environment, the room's lit up in some sense, um, and I look around me, and I see there's a laptop, I see there's a, uh, a cup, I see that there is um, a book here. Well, when I perceive these objects by turning my attention towards them, they trigger my, my perceptual faculties to give me beliefs about things in my external environment. So when I'm perceiving and looking at things, my, sensual, my sensor, sensory faculties become triggered, and then I form the belief, oh, there's a cup. Oh, there's a laptop. Oh, there's a book. I don't look at my laptop and then say, well, it appears to me that there's a laptop in front of me. Therefore, there's a laptop in front of me. I don't argue that. I merely cast my attention towards something and that triggers my faculties to give me a belief, a basic belief. Likewise, um, if we have a theistic, a fitri theistic disposition, if I look at a mere flower, because God created this thing and set it up as a means to know him, if I look at it in the right environment and reflect upon it, that might trigger my fitri theistic disposition in just the same way that looking at a cup would, say, trigger my sensory perceptions to give me the belief there's the cup. I'm not actually arguing and say, looking at the flower and thinking, oh, this flower looks very beautiful. Oh, 
it's probably being designed. Oh, therefore, there's a designer. Oh, that designer is probably God. Therefore, God exists. None of that's going on. I'm merely being positioned in the right sort of environment. And I'm reflecting on the science that God has set up to correspond with my theistic disposition. And when I reflect upon them, it's triggered such that I have this immediate sense of God's existence. Um, and that's, I think, a very common way in which believers form their belief about God. They might just reflect on the beauty of a sunset in the uh, in the summer and, and think, subhanAllah, God, God is present, God is there. You know, they don't argue from the vision of the sunset to God, but it fills them up with this overwhelming sense that God exists. It triggers something in them. It gives them an immediate belief that God exists. So that's the way science function. They don't function as um, arguments. You can develop an argument from them, but they, they function in, in a more basic way. And likewise, put any But basically, got, yeah. arguments, arguments that evidentialists use yeah. uh, involves a certain method of articulating, whether it's in a syllogistic format, you know, premises followed by conclusion, or some other format, to justif to justify the 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 uh, the impact that these signs are having on 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 on, on several people, right? Because I because yeah. I think you know, all right. So you know, you can have a certain argument. They'll, they'll lay out the premises, and they're basically trying to argue that every effect must have a cause, right? Right. While when you go out in nature and you're pondering and you're reflecting and you're yeah. looking uh, everywhere around you, you know, as the Quran says, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're looking yeah. at, at the cattle, you're looking at the mountains, you're, you know, how, what was all this, you know, look at how all this was created and how all this was fashioned. Okay, you're probably pondering and you're not immediately, you know, the premises are not being, you know, uh, fleshed out in your head. Okay, premise one, premise two, premise three, conclusion, eureka, right? It, it, yeah. But it seems like you're kind of absorbing all of that in you, yeah. right? Like you're absorbing all the premises that the, that the, eviden that the evident evidentialist is fleshing out without actually saying it out loud. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and because what you're actually feeling is that this could not have come out of nowhere. And mm -hmm. the evidentialist will articulate and flesh that out by arguing, yeah, n nothing could come from nothing, right? Uh, something cannot right. come from nothing, right? So, I mean, so is it that we're, you know, is, or is the difference here merely a matter of how to express ourselves or a method of, you know, how we're expressing what we are believing or justifying to another person how we're believing? Um, you know, is that what's going on here, or is it more of okay? The filtra, the filtra based epistemology is that look, you're you know, something's just triggering something inside you, um, mm -hmm. and you just know it's true, uh, mm -hmm. and you don't have to, you know, know how to argue for it in order to justify believing in that. Yeah, no, these I'm are... all over the place, but I'm just trying no, to like, not at all. Of... These are very good points, I think. One of the things that the, the reformed epistemologists in general and what we might want to say with respect to Ibn Taymiyyah's account here is not that we're making what's called a tacit inference. We're not unconsciously uh, or subconsciously moving from premises. That's not the idea. Um, now, one might try to articulate that, but that has a couple of problems. Um, so I think there's reason to think that that's not what's going on. Now, I could try and spell out some of those reasons, although I want to say a bit more about that on the very last sure. pen penultimate slide. But, but let me just say, to begin with, um, that, you know, earlier we said that, look, your beliefs, some of them are basic and some of them are non-basic. And we suggested that you can have knowledge okay, of something in a basic way, if you have a faculty that's primed um, to give you that kind of knowledge. We also said that if we don't allow for basic beliefs, then an infinite regress ensues. Because if 
we say that in order for a belief to be justified, it needs to be based on another belief and then that belief on another and another ad infinitum. We don't have justification and we don't have knowledge now, but then consider all of our beliefs about what's in our external environment. Um, say you have a belief that there's a tree in the garden. Well, I had to learn the concept of a tree from somewhere, right? So are we saying that, you know, I have an experience, say, um, of a tree and that, you know, I'm, I'm basically saying, well, look, um, it appears to me that there's a tree. Therefore, there is a tree. If you say that, you don't have knowledge of a tree because that's not a valid argument. If I say it appears to me that there is a tree, therefore there is a tree, that's not a valid argument. It doesn't necessarily follow that there's a tree. You could be hallucinating or something else, right? There are at least at the level of logical validity. So what we have to say rather is that, yes, our basic beliefs, um, our basic perceptual beliefs, let's say, are somehow connected causally to different beliefs that we have, like different concepts. Um, but the way that these concepts work are not such that we infer from them, but that these concepts just shape and filter our perception. So, you know, as we grow and uh, as children, we start to learn lots of different concepts. But some of the concepts that we learn uh, we just learn in, in a kind of natural way. So, you know, we, we learn just by looking around us how to differentiate between red and blue. You know, if we just see things that are red and blue, we, we recognize conceptually there is a distinction between these colors. We conceptually recognize distinctions between shapes. Um, you know, some shapes or forms that are larger than others, smaller than others. And we recognize that there are various different physical objects in our environment. And so we start to form all these different concepts. And when I learn that there's a concept of say a car, um, now that concept helps shape my perceptions. So that when I'm looking out and I see a car, I have a basic belief. It's what we've called epistemically basic in the sense that it doesn't have to be based on an argument for it to be justified. But that belief is, in a sense, causally connected to different concepts that I have formed. So what we're saying when we come to theistic science then is that essentially when we look and we reflect upon the signs in nature, we are, those signs rather, trigger our fifthly theistic disposition. And it might be that... Um, in order for that to work in some sense, we require concepts, say certain concepts um, about designedness, beauty, even God, which filter our perception. But it's not the case that we're actually inferring from, from premises. And a belief is a propositional attitude. It's a specific attitude we take towards a proposition. We are not moving from propositions. Rather, our perceptual faculties are giving us information, which is shaped and filtered by concepts. And that belief will ultimately be epistemically basic in that it's justified not because of an inference from propositions, but because of a faculty which is primed in such a way to be able to give us um, knowledge without needing an argument or inference. So that's, I think, the way to understand it. Um, and that will be, be, be something I come back to, as I said, right towards the end of the presentation. So we have theistic natural science, which can trigger our fifthly theistic disposition. And we also have Quranic science, signs that God has um, revealed through his speech. And when we reflect upon both, if our fitrize, uh, our fitri theistic disposition is working well and, and so forth, 
then um, we can come to knowledge um, that God exists and not through an argument, but in this epistemically basic way, even if, as I'm suggesting, there is a causal relationship between uh, concepts which uh, filter and shape our perception. Now, of course, it's well known that Ibn Taymiyyah recognizes that the fitrah can be impaired in some sense. As we suggested earlier, the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, suggests that. Um, for instance, this idea that the parents of children shape and influence the religion that people, uh, that children end up adopting. Um, now, Ibn Taymiyyah, he actually, he says that that fitrah, uh, in a nutshell, is just this propensity to recognize that, that, that God exists and he alone is to be worshipped. Um, essentially, you know, la ilaha illallah. Um, but he thinks that, you know, there are certain intellectual, moral, and social vices that can impair fitrah. And there are intellectual, moral virtues which can nurture fitrah. So suppose, um, and he gives examples of, say, like um, certain shubuhat um, or, or van, forms of just speculating, um, taqlid, different forms of just imitating one's society, that could be things that impair fitrah. And um, essentially, at least in this sense, the fitri theistic disposition that we have. So in response to those potential impediments, it might mean that we need to um, develop certain intellectual and moral and spiritual virtues. Um, for instance, we know from the Islamic tradition that disbelievers who defiantly disobey, uh, disobey God might have their heart are closed, um, that sin places a black spot on our heart. And, um, and even Taymiya thinks that the heart is, is, um, is the center of all cognition. So it might be that those kind of impediments prevent our fit, fit three theistic disposition from, from working uh, the way that it's supposed to work um, and act as a kind of cloud or veil over the fitla. But then the flip side is that moral virtue, spiritual virtue, um, you know, being close to God and being righteous can aid fitra. And that even intellectual um, uh, virtues, say, um, being open to evidence, we might think, might be useful in uh, nurturing fitra. And of course, being in the right kind of environment. If somebody is in the wrong environment where they are clouded with doubts um, and objections, it might be difficult for their fit to the theistic position, disposition to kind of pull through in those in environments. And so we might need to position ourselves in, uh, in more local environments where our theistic disposition and recognition of God can thrive. So in a nutshell then, Ibn Taymiyyah's account of reformed epistemology says that um, the S, somebody can know that Islam is true in a basic manner, in a properly basic manner, if and only if her belief is produced by her fitri theistic disposition, we might add it, that that disposition is working properly in the right kind of environment. And we're going to get to this shortly um, about there not being any defeater, but let's just bracket that for the moment. So that S can know that Islam is true in a basic way, if but only if her belief is produced by her fitri theistic disposition in the right kind of environment. And of course, her belief in Islam will be produced by a combination typically of um, theistic natural signs and Quranic signs of which um, trigger that disposition. Now, I want to move on to looking at some objections, but before that, I want to, um, to look at a few different important statements from Ibn Taymiyyah himself, translated into English anyway, um, about the account. Just before that, I want to um, 
to point out something interesting here. Now, some people object to belief in God and they might object to Islam by saying that, look, you know, even if Islam is true, even if God exists, uh, you know, you, you can't know that it's true because that sort of the belief is just the result of like wish fulfillment or, or, or something like that. Um, Freud and, and Marx had this kind of objection. Um, f- I think Freud had this idea that, you know, belief in God is just the result of positing like a father figure that we need to feel protected and the like. And um, so even if it just so happened that belief in God is true, you can't know it. And this kind of objection to religious belief is called a de jure objection. By contrast, a de facto objection just says, well, that belief is false. Islam is not right or God God doesn't exist because of suffering in the world or because of some other reason. Now, what this account suggests to us is an important thing, that you cannot plausibly make any de jure objection to Islamic belief without combining it with a de facto objection. In other words, you can't say, oh, well, you can't know Islam is true without showing that Islam is false. Because if Islam is true, then God has given us a capacity to know him in a basic way as per Ibn Taymiyyah's account. So you'd have to show that Islam is false if the jury objection of that kind is to work. And I think that's uh, an interesting thing just to bear in mind. But if we wanted to be fair to non-Muslims, yeah. Uh, then that means that non-Muslims could equally make that claim uh, in that they will say, look, I have this strong inner dispositional feeling that my religion is true. So if we were to be consistent, that means it would not suffice for the Muslim to say, well, you're not justified in believing your religion is true absent any evidence. Um but, but the Muslim would have to provide that defeater in order to get that non-Muslim to change his mind. Uh, just for the sake of consistency, because otherwise then everyone can make that claim. Right? Yeah, no, the, yes and no. So you're right in saying that, yeah, it's very true that Christians, Jews, and other um, believers can say to an atheist, um, you know, you can't say that I don't know my religion is true unless you prove it's not. And that's fine. I think this objection or the distinction between the jury and de facto is one that relates mainly to to atheists. You know, people mm-hmm. who want to claim that, oh, your belief in God is suspect or your belief in Islam is suspect in the sense you can't even know it's true. Well, they'd have to show us that it's false. Now, with respect to us dismissing other religious traditions, um, I think as I'm going to try to outline in the next um, few slides, it's not going to be the case that um, a Muslim believer necessarily has to have an argument that uh, another faith is not true, even though they probably often think they do have such arguments, but rather they just have to be justified in some way in thinking that that other religious tradition is not true. How would that be? Well, if you're justified in thinking Islam is true, ipso facto, you're justified in thinking anything that denies Islam yeah. is not true. Um, so, yeah, finally, before we look at the objections, here are a few important statements that Ibn Taymiyyah makes. Uh, this one is in his uh, Majmul Fatawa, which suggests that the, the, the idea of, of God, the creator, um, and that he is a perfect being, is, is fitri and daruri with respect to the one who's... Um, Fitrah remains intact. And so this is the basic, there are so many diff- there are so many like parallel statements here, but this is a basic statement of affirming reformed epistemology, we might say. Um, I could have picked uh, a different one. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah also suggests here that um, that everything in, in, in creation is an, is an ayah, is a sign of God. So this is the idea that God has set up these sort of natural signs and that, you know, a sign indicates an object itself, of which it is the sign, and that's the function. And that's also from his Majmur um, and Fatel. And this very interesting 
passage from his Arrad al Muntiqiyin is suggesting to us that we can know, we can possess knowledge of the Creator and even of prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu prophecy without argument, without al aqisa without syllogistic reasoning, because he suggests that it is known to us um, by the ayat that God has set up um, or revealed. And it's known by means of, again here, this notion of, of ضروري, uh, ضروري, this idea of knowing it in a non-inferential way. And that it doesn't even require a form of, of nadar, which we might um, consider discursive reasoning. Um, is he talking in, to Muslims here? Is he talking about Muslims here? So that, have, that yeah. are already that have already experienced Islam, read, you know, understood understand its teachings, read the Quran, you know, have a basic, you know, level familiarity with the Sira. Is he is he is he talking about you know the 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 pretty much because I know the, I don't want to open up a whole can of worms about iman and muqallid the iman of the yeah. Blind believer or, or, of, of, of yeah. the you know of the Muslim that is just you know um, not engaging in all these independent rational uh, contemplations. Yeah. But is that who he is speaking about here? So he's definitely talking about the Muslim. Yeah, um, that's clear because he's saying that you know the Muslim who affirms the the existence of Allah and the prophethood of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that for the Muslim then. Such knowledge does not depend on having a kind of syllogism. Um, and it's attained through through um, our witnessing of science. Now, I suppose even with respect to the um, the, the muqallid, um, you know, they would have an awareness of the science of God, you know, just in virtue of just getting out of the house um, or just looking at people and, and also that they're familiar with the Qur'an. So, yeah, I think it's talking about Muslims of all stripes, as far as I can tell. Um, and, of course, you raise a really important uh, point, uh, Baslam, about this idea of um, possessing knowledge of God, even if you don't have, have, have arguments like many ordinary uh, and simple uh, believers don't. And um, the reason why I think that's important is because, because sometimes... The, some of the mutakallimun, like the Asha'ira, etc., have been accused of making like a mass takfir of the awam, of the ordinary people, because they don't actually possess these kinds of arguments. And um, um, I think that's a problem, whereas we don't have that problem with this account. We yeah. can actually... I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean to be fair to the Asha'ira, I mean, I, I think maybe, uh, maybe a minority of them probably hold... You know, oh yeah, definitely. Of, yeah, I mean, like uh, 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 Imam Sanusi and, and and perhaps a few yeah, others. Exactly. Uh, but, yeah. but correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, I, you know, I haven't looked into this in a, for a while. But uh, I still think, but I do think that at the end, I, they do different. They would say that the Iman of the Muqallid still accepted Jaiz, but it it's not in that Kamal or perfected state if he doesn't know the certain arguments that. Even the specific arguments that the Mutakalimun developed, not just, you know, but do you have your share of rational arguments that help you help you keep your faith in Islam strong? But no, I think it's like even knowing their particular set of arguments on Hudud and yeah. whatnot. I mean, I don't want to get into that, but yeah, I, as you said, I mean, this is a kind of a can of worms. I mean, yeah, there, are, yeah. there are different positions, um, you know, and the thing is, even within, yeah, like say knowing uh, arguments it might have to be i think al jawaini talked about the idea of having to know the specific arguments and even the the objections and if you don't quite even understand the, the objections you have to know the proper counter objections and and so it's quite stringent um but there is a scope um but it seems to me that the the, the, the asharis have a harder time than the metodidis do in suggesting that um that that, that faith is valid actually um, but again, I don't want to go into that. Yeah. But I'm sure that most um, contemporary Asharis would, would obviously say that it's valid. But the problem is not mere validity. The problem is knowledge. Because mm. 
they they say um, that knowledge of God cannot be al uh, daruri and it has to be al muqtasal. It can't be non-inferential, and it has to be inferential. Yeah, it's got to be upward. Yeah, exactly. And the problem with that is, if the arguments are not sufficient to give knowledge of God, which which I don't think they are, when you think about what knowledge entails, the stringent requirement of knowledge, um, so that's going to be yeah. a problem because we're going to say that the, the 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 kind of arguments that the ordinary believer is going to have, they're not sufficient to confer knowledge on that believer, in my view. So you're basically, it's akin to saying they don't know God. Yeah, so so basically, the, I mean, the strength of the Tamian model, then, is that he's not only showing why we ought to tolerate the Iman of the masses as valid, but rather he's providing and articulating a powerful way of justifying uh, mm -hmm. the Iman of, of your, uh, you know, of the commoner. And and again, yeah. like I mean, like you said, I mean, when it comes to you know, uh, obviously, you know, the, the common folks are, are are just not capable of digesting and you know the, the these kanami arguments in depth, uh, you know, at, at a serious capacity. Because I mean, at the at the end of the day, how far do you want to go? Because like, okay, is it enough to know the kanami arguments? Uh, but do you also have to know how to rebut the rebuttals to them? And do you have to know how to counter refute the counter rebuttals to your rebuttals to the rebuttals? Right. And, and it seems like an endless, um, you know, endless process. Yes, um, I agree. I agree. And, and, I, I, and just looking at the, yes, at the Mutakallimun's literature as well is that, you, I mean, you'll see Imam Al-Amidi, who is a prominent Ashari theologian, rebutting m most of the arguments that his companions in the same theological school put forth for the arguments for, you know, uh, Hadooth, and he yeah. put, puts forth his own arguments, right? And oh. and so even that is not settled. So how are you going to expect, you know, the common folk to read all this literature and digest it? So it, it, it yeah. appears to me that, you know, Taimian epistemology here at the very least is providing a powerful justification for the iman of your common Muslim out there. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think, you know, the other problem is, is um, what value is the argument, say, um, accessible to, to an ordinary believer? What value is that actually bringing? Because now people say, well, look, because of all of relig the, the, the religious disagreement and religious diversity, we need arguments. That's usually the, the basic thought. Um, but, you know, if an ordinary believer possesses an argument for thinking God exists and Islam is true, well, they've got to know that Christians also have their arguments. And so how, how much, what difference is it then from them, say, having an argument, knowing that somebody's got a counter argument or just having this really strong, immediate experience of God? You know, I don't really see, see the difference there. Um, yeah. I, in other words, I don't see what the the argument is doing in terms of adding value, but um, rather what's important is that we have this kind of um, faculty working properly in the right you know, environment. And, you know, and, and, and I'm just to stress this point and, and, you know, sort of interject a lot here, but I mean, just speaking from, you know, roughly 17 years or 18 years experience in apologetics, I can mm -hmm. say with a certainty that your common Muslim just knows, just knows that the Trinity is false, that the incarnation is false. Yeah. But if you put him up against a Christian academic or theologian or a prominent Christian philosopher, the, you know, he's not going to be able to intellectually dominate no. that, that individual. He, he, he just won't be able to. And alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah we have great mm -hmm. Muslim apologists sure. that, that do the job, but they make it seem easy. But they, did a, they spent a lot of time doing their homework, right? Sure. So, uh, I mean, it's just something, you know, to, to, to point out. Yeah, please continue. And the, the final thing, Baslam, that I want to throw in the mix, and um, I won't have time to really address this necessarily today, but, but let me try to address it later on, is that some of the Mutakallimun suggest that, look, you know, there is a distinction between a fad ayn and a fad kifayah. 
Mm. And mm. what they want to suggest is that it's not an obligation for every individual that they have to have these arguments, but it's an obligation communally. Mm. The community um, should have arguments in play. And I'm quite sympathetic to that view in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one of the, the, the reasons... With Imam al-Ghazali pushed that view. Yeah, yeah among, among others. Yeah. And, um, you know, for instance, there is this view called um, sensible evidentialism. And um, it says this, basically, look, you and I, we believe in the existence of electrons. Uh, and our basis for doing that is that we read it in the textbook. Or basically, a scientist tells us. So epistemically, we believe it in a basic way. Scientist tells us, read in a textbook, we don't have an argument, we believe in a basic way. Um, and that's fine, just so long as there's some scientist out there who's actually done the homework and come up with the evidence and inferred the existence of these things. Now, we are in a set, the epistemic health of our basic belief depends in some sense on the evidence available to that scientist out there in the community doing that work and gathering that evidence. Now, suppose there just wasn't evidence at all available to the scientists and they just made that up. That would probably count against the epistemic health of our belief. Um, we might have some justification, but we probably won't have knowledge, obviously. Or scientists were disputing with each other over it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, that does raise a question of where arguments might be necessary in a communal sense, even if not in an individual sense, and maybe... At the end, I'll try and address that if you can remind me. Okay, so turning now from the account, which in a nutshell has basically said, look, if Islam is true, and God has created us upon a fitra and has set up these signs in creation and in the Quran, and uh, if our disposition, our theistic, fitri theistic disposition is working properly, then that kind of a skill is reliable enough to give us... Um, to give us knowledge of, of God and, e and even Islam in the right uh, environments and the like. But of course, there are plenty of objections to this view. We have been discussing some problems in part as we've um, touched on various slides, but I want to look more comprehensively at perhaps the key objections to Taymiyyan religious epistemology, not to suggest these are the only objections, but these are the objections I feel that keep cropping up um, within this discussion about reformed epistemology in general. So in a sense, I'm actually, um, I mean, I tried to flesh out Ibn Taymiyyah's re religious epistemology by using concepts available in contemporary philosophy. I um, mean, that, that's what I just did. But looking at these objections, there are objections which relate to that account, the Taymiyyah account, in one sense, but they also just relate to reformed epistemology in a more general sense. So um, these are our objections, basically, that we're going to look at. Um, objection one to five, we have what I've called an argument from circularity, an argument from the cultural contingency of our religious beliefs, an argument from religious disagreement, an argument from the cognitive science of religion, and an argument from proper basicality. So let's turn our attention then toward our first objection here, the argument from circularity. And the argument from circularity goes something like this. This model of Islamic religious knowledge simply assumes Islam to be true. It assumes that God exists and has created us with such a thing called fitra. Therefore, this is somehow circular or question begging. It just assumes um, Islam to be true and that God exists and that there is such a thing as fitra and ayat, etc. Um, and so there's something wrong with it from that perspective. So what might we say in reply? Um, the, the model clearly isn't based on the assumption that Islam um, is true per se. Rather, it's based on the conditional that if Islam is true, then certain things follow from it. In other words, if Islam is true, Allah exists. The Quran is his revelation. He created us upon fitrah. According to Ibn Taymiyyah, he gave us a theistic disposition to know him in a basic way on the basis of signs in creation and in the Quran. So it doesn't assume that it's true. It's based on the conditional if it is true. Um, now, notice something important about this. 
we've been talking about the different capacities and faculties of knowledge that we have as human beings, say sense perception, reason, introspection, memory, etc. Now, I can't prove in a non-question begging or circular way that my faculties are reliable or properly functioning or aimed at truth. Why? Because in order to do that, I'd have to rely upon them to prove that they're reliable. So if I want to prove to you that my faculties are reliable, I have to assume they're reliable to then check whether they're reliable. If somebody asks me, well, um, how do you know that your sense perception is reliable? I'll say, well, you know, I have many different sensory experiences throughout my life, which all suggest to me that they're reliable. But then in my checking, in my relying upon its output, I'm just assuming it to be reliable from the get-go. Um, likewise, I can't prove that my faculties, all of them, have not been designed just to help me survive and reproduce, or just, um, you know, they have a kind of wish-fulfilling element based inside of them. I can't prove that that's not the case, um, because, again, in order to check, I'd surely have to assume that they're truth apt and truth reliable. Otherwise, I couldn't rely on my conclusions to the question of whether they are or whether they're not. So if our faculties are properly functioning, reliable, truth aimed, then we say, I can know that the relevant belief is true. So if my sensory perceptions has been set up in such a way that it's aimed at truth, it's functioning properly in the right kind of environment, then surely, because that kind of a faculty is primed to guarantee us that the belief is true, then I can know it's true. But I can't prove in a non-question begging or circular way uh, that they are. Right. But basically, so I, what, what, what this is saying, though, is that the, the, you know, the, the, the reformed argument is only aimed at you justifying your belief to yourself and defending basically you're ba you're, you're you're basically not giving dawa per se with this method you're not basically saying to people look i so strongly believe that islam is true my fitra says it uh that's what it inspires me to believe therefore you should also become a muslim no, rather what you're doing here is basically explaining why you're a Muslim, why you feel that you're justified uh, in being a Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, can't go, it can't go beyond that. Like it, it can't, maybe it can, I don't know, I didn't give it much thought, but, but you're not using it for the purposes of da'wah here. You're using it to just explain why you are justified in believing what you believe. Yeah, true. Well, I Absent mean... a defeater, okay. Yeah, we, we've, we've suggested how it might be possible to know Islam to be true. Um, if we're a believer, we haven't tried to give an argument to show Islam is true. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect to being justified or rational in thinking it actually is true, um, I'm going to say something about that in the next couple of bullet points, because somebody might object to what I've just said and say, but then if my knowing Islam is, is based merely on the conditional truth of Islam, how can I be assured I'm actually rational in holding it to be true, right? Because what we've said thus far is if Islam is true, then X, Y, Z follow. Okay, great. But then how do I know I'm actually being rational in taking it to be true and all the things that follow from it? Well, the response to this is that in the absence of a defeat, so in the absence of having grounds for thinking Islam is false, or thinking that it's been produced by um, an unreliable faculty, we are rational in taking the products of our faculties to be true. So let me just try to explain this a little bit more clearly. In a nutshell, it's trying, it's saying this that. Our experiences, our seemings and appearances are innocent till proven guilty. 
So, and that's that's just in general. That's not specific to our Islamic beliefs. So that when I have this seeming that there's a laptop in front of me, um, that gets a free pass, let's say. It's innocent until I've got reason for suspecting that the laptop's not in front of me. Maybe somebody um, has, uh, I don't know, slipped something into my drink and I'm hallucinating about laptops or something. And he tells me he slipped that into my drink. Then I've got a reason to doubt that there's a laptop in front of me. Now, of course, if somebody says, well, well, hang on a minute, shouldn't it be the case that we treat things as guilty until proven innocent? The problem is with, uh, with, with that would be that, okay, so we have a, a seeming that the laptop um, is in front of me, let's say, and we're treating it as guilty until proven innocent. So what do we need to move it from guilty to innocent? Well, all that we can rely on are other seemings and other appearances and other experiences. So if we don't start with treating them innocent until proven guilty, we'll never know anything. We'll just be stuck in a skeptical book. We won't be able to get out. We have to assume an experience in general somewhere is innocent until proven guilty. And that seems quite reasonable. You know, epistemologists have developed a view, or one of them, called phenomenal conservatism. And it says that um, S, someone, is justified in believing that P, um, if it seems to S that P in the absence of any to be So if it seems to somebody um, that P, then prima facie, face value, they have some justification. Now, that's not ultima facie. That's not in the end, all things considered. Um, so the same holds, you know, for, for all of our faculties. If I, if I remember what I had for breakfast, if I remember what I did yesterday, if I have a perception of what's in front of me, if I have an introspection about what I'm feeling, um, if somebody tells me something and, you know, they're a reliable person, all of these should be taken as innocent until proven guilty. I'm justified. I'm rational in doing that. Um I think the bigger objection comes, uh, but I don't know if I'm, you know, speaking ahead. If so, then, uh, you know, please ignore the question and make it ask it later. But uh, I think the, the bigger concern, I think, that people have here is, is not that, okay, you know, you, you're, you're, you're presuming something to be true. Well, um, well, I guess it's more than presuming, right? It's claiming to know that something is true. Uh, right. But... But let's say the atheist comes and says to the Muslim, um, the problem of evil, right? Um, this is problematic because, and this is my argument, right? Your God is all good. Your God is all powerful, yet evil exists. The attributes are clashing. It's a logical contradiction. Therefore, your God does not exist, O oh, Muslim. Now, the Muslim is not trained to respond to this atheist, Right? He's not trained. He hasn't read the latest literature and his, the Muslim's bad luck. Some atheist professor happens to come his way and, and you know, and try to try to dominate him intellectually. But here, the Muslim may say to himself, look, I know I don't know how to respond to you, but I just know Islam is true. And therefore, you're not going to shake my iman, right? I know my limits. I know that I can't answer everything, but I know it's true. And I don't need to know how to rebut your argument in order to remain justified being a Muslim. I think this is the sensitive scenario that I think a lot of people um, clash over. Probably, this is probably where evidentialists and maybe reformed epistemologists might strongly disagree with each other, whereby the ev evidentialists would say, no, listen, the guy posed an argument against your faith. He did pose an argument against your belief. You are morally required to know how to rebut it. It's a defeater. Uh, right. While the epistemologist might say, um, well, it's not a definitive defeater in the one plus one equals two sense. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you remain justified to postpone knowing the response to this argument or just ignore it entirely. And this is where, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah also talks about learning how to differentiate between definitive arguments and speculative arguments. So 
But yeah. again, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts about that? I don't know if you're going to talk about that later in the presentation, but uh, I think this is what uh, I think this is the problem that a lot of people have in mind. Like, when is it okay to not let arguments bother you? Yeah, no, I think that's um, a fair point, and I do absolutely turn to address this issue. Great. Okay. Um, sorry, sorry if I asked earlier. Uh, just uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> I, I object. I, I do address it in the sense that I, I, I offer the tools to address a specific thing, but I focus on religious disagreement as opposed to a disagreement with a theist and, a, and an atheist, a Muslim theist, let's say. But the tools that we're going to get from that, we can use to think about disagreement between a Muslim theist and an atheist. Now, one of the things though, that we're going to see is that defeaters and stuff are, are going to be kind of person relative. So, I think in your example, uh, Bassam, you, you know, you gave an example of, of like an ordinary, very simple um, believer. And then you've got an ex and then we've got this case of um, of a professor, let's say, or a very sophisticated atheist. Uh, you know, there are a couple of things to say. It seems to me that, you know, the, the atheist might lay out an objection to that ordinary person. Let's make it super ordinary. Let's make it like someone's. Muslim grandma in a village, right? Um, she's not even going to understand that. Right? That's the first point. She's not going to understand that. Now, it seems to me that if she doesn't even understand it, she doesn't have a defeater. And I'll tell you why. Because if somebody is writing a super ironclad argument against our views in some basement um, on like... Uh, down in Australia or something, and I've never heard of it. That does nothing to affect the justification of my belief. I'm not uh, rationally uh, being irrational or acting contrary to my epistemic duties or not being within my reason, within reason for holding a uh, belief just because some random guy in a basement in Australia is writing a really good argument. I'm going to have to have, uh, that's going to have to be a new piece of information I acquire in some sense. And it's only acquired if I if I even understand it properly. Uh, I think that our old lady or the grandma, I think that she she might not even be able to understand it. And so it'd be akin to like me not being, uh, you know, me not knowing about this argument in the basement in Australia. So I don't think that she would she would even have a defeater. But suppose that we say that she's a really really clever grandma, and she does kind of grasp it then I think that she has a way out that might be quite easy for her, but it might suggest that arguments are in some sense necessary, but not for her. And that would be that she knows that this is, there's this atheist professor um, who has this argument, but suppose she has a friend who knows this really clever Muslim scholar, and she knows that, He's so you know he's clever enough to have an objection to that kind of argument. I think that for the old for the old lady for the grandma, I think that would be sufficient for her. Now, that suggests arguments are necessary, right? Because that Muslim guy has to have arguments at least in this scenario, an objection, which he probably does, as she thinks, and I think she's within her rights to think that. But notice the argument is not a positive argument for for Islam. All God exists. It's just a counter argument. It's just engaged in negative apologetics. The theistic evidentialist believes in positive apologetics. You have to positively prove God, positively uh -huh. prove Islam. Uh -huh. Whereas in this case, it'd be still different because you're actually not positively proving, you're just merely rebutting objections. Okay. Mm. And the reformed epistemologist is 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 not going to to deny that in certain contexts that might be necessary. Um, but as I suggested, I even think that this old lady, she herself wouldn't even need an argument. I don't think so, because I don't think she'd even have a defeater. Now, so to, to wrap this up, I think that basically we treat our appearances, experiences and seemings as innocent till proven guilty. Um, because if we didn't, we'd be stuck in some kind of global skepticism. But remember, that's only prima facie. And so... If we do come across defeaters, then the scenario changes and people will argue that the, the situation uh, with Islamic belief is such that there are going to be defeaters because you're aware of say, Christians, Jews and others 
who can make the same kind of response here and just say, well, it seems to me that Islam, that Judaism is true or Christianity is true or Islam is true. And so more needs to be said. But yeah. as per the argument from the circularity thing alone, uh, it, it's not obviously a problem per se. So um, if that first objection doesn't work, namely this argument from circularity, perhaps there is another objection um, to Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, religious epistemology that might be more problematic. Call this the argument from uh, con the contingency of religious belief. And this argument looks something like this. Um, yeah, and I've, I've borrowed this particular formulation of the argument from this, uh, uh, this article that I definitely recommend, The Problem of, of Contingency for Religious Belief by Thomas Bogardus. Um, I, I was also in contact with him, and, and my uh, response to this objection he um, approves of. So it's not, it was good to hear. But anyway, so this argument, which um, Thomas uh, Bogardus basically calls the bare counterfactual argument um, from contingency religious belief, because it's basically positing a kind of counterfactual conditional if you had been in a different place at a different time to where you're actually raised or something, then um, that would be epistemically problematic. So the argument is this. If you had been born and raised elsewhere, else when, you would have had different religious beliefs. Therefore, your religious beliefs don't count as knowledge. So, I mean, it's not obvious I think to anyone just viewing these, this argument from this one premise to conclusion that the conclusion necessarily follows. Um, and it seems to me that this, this, this argument um, is going to be rebutted um, by pointing out a couple of things. The first thing to consider, though, is um, a small exchange between Alvin Plantinga who, of course, is the pioneer and forerunner of reformed epistemology, and John Hick, who um, the chair of, of, of philosophy at the University of Birmingham, where, where I'm at, is named after him, and it's occupied by Yuji Nagasawa. John Hick was a, a prominent philosopher of religion. Um, now, one of the differences between Plantinga and Hick was that Plantinga um, was what we might call a religious exclusivist, and John Hick, a religious pluralist. So John Hick basically thought that there is some kind of truth embedded within all different religious traditions. And John Hick thought that you were sort of not within your rights epistemically to be exclusivist with respect to any one religious tradition. Um, and one of the reasons why John Hick thought that this was the case was because of the fact that he said, well, look, you know, had you been born elsewhere and, and, and elsewhere, you'd have probably ended up having different religious beliefs. Now, Alvin Plantinga, on the other hand, he thought that it is perfectly rational. You can be justified and even know your religious belief is true um, in the exclusivist sense. Of course, Plantinga is a Christian and, uh, you know, we might think of ourselves as Muslim exclusivists. Now, the first thing that, that Plantinga points out to John Hick in their sort of written exchange um, really sort of, sort of um, I don't know, breaks the, uh, the argument in its tracks or something. So Plantinga, he says, look, suppose we can see that if I'd been born in Madagascar rather than Michigan, my beliefs would have been quite different for one thing. I probably wouldn't believe that I was born in Michigan. So Plantinga goes to point out, that first and foremost, the very fact that I have certain beliefs because of where I was born and because of the time that I was born in doesn't show that my belief is somehow unjustified or irrational. As he suggests, had he been born in Madagascar, he wouldn't have had the belief that he was born in Michigan he would have had the belief that he was born in Madagascar. Now, does that mean his belief that he was born in Michigan is not justified or it's irrational or he doesn't know it? Clearly not. 
Um, I had an, another example that, that, that someone gave um, uh, along these lines, and they were saying, well, oh, they, um, they liked a, um, a certain TV series, and they liked it so much that they felt they were almost addicted to it, and they wanted to stop watching it. And, um, and so they vowed to definitely stop watching it. Um, and then they happened to be um, traveling somewhere for a conference, and uh, they, were on the, they were on the plane, and uh, they were sort of bored and just looking what's on the screen on the plane. And lo and behold, they, they found that that TV series was there with its final episodes. And because they were bored and they sort of couldn't resist, they ended up watching uh, the, um, the final episodes of the series. And so they formed beliefs such as the ending was so-and-so, or the ending was like so-and-so. But it, it just seems it was, in their case, because they didn't plan to go to this conference, they didn't plan for this flight or anything. It was just quite lucky and fortunate for them, given where they were and, and so on, that they ended up having this belief about the ending of this TV series given that they vowed to never watch it. So just because a belief could be seriously lucky in the sense that um, our whereabouts, let's say, um, influence us having that belief doesn't necessarily count against it. Now, what planting goes on to add to Hick is that, of course, the same goes for the pluralist. Because Hick was saying, look, Plantinger, you wouldn't be a religious exclusivist, Calvinist, Christian or whatever had you been born somewhere else. And Plantinger was like, yeah, and you wouldn't have been a religious pluralist if you hadn't been born in 21st or 20th century, rather, Britain. But what does Hick say? He says, this is true, but how relevant is it? And what he was saying to Plantinger was that, and I think his reply is, is, is fine. He says to Plantinga, yes, but for like 99% of people, the reason why they believe their religion to be true is just because of their cultural social environment. But the reason why I'm a religious pluralist is not simply because of my, um, say, historical context, but also because I have a thought about it and I've got reasons and I've got arguments and therefore, it's based on some kind of rational grounds beyond mere cultural placing and setting. Huh. Um, sorry, just my charger. Um, so, John Hick, I think he has a point. You know, I think he's got a fair point. But we can actually use the Hickian response to respond to the argument itself. Because Hick is basically saying, you know, look, um, my belief is different because it's produced by a kind of skill or ability. Um, um, you know, it's it's produced on the basis of my reasoning and inferring and reflection. Okay, so what we want to say um, to this argument is that actually knowledge can tolerate a certain kind of look. Plantinga said that had he been born in Madagascar, not Michigan, he wouldn't have had the belief he was born in Michigan. Okay. Now, does that mean, even though it's a kind of lucky belief, does that mean that he doesn't know that he's born in Michigan now? Just because if he was born somewhere else, he wouldn't have that belief? No, it doesn't. Why? Because it's based on some reliable grounds. Like He has experiences that the place he's in is Michigan. His parents told him he was born in Michigan and so forth. He has, I don't know, um, a birth certificate that says he was born in the, the hospital in Michigan and so on. But what's important is not accidents of birth, but are the grounds, okay, behind, by which one ends up believing, whether it's, uh, you know, Madagascar, Michigan or whatever. Consider then that if God exists and by Islam, extension Islam is true, and you are privileged Okay, by being born in the right sort of environment for your theistic fitri disposition, then your belief will be the result of a certain skill. It will be the result of a intellectual virtue, in fact, a reliable, well-designed faculty that God has instilled within you. And so given our understanding of knowledge, it will be a case of knowledge. So... Um, the argument 
although it highlights that it's quite lucky, um, you know, in the sense uh, that our beliefs can be lucky in the sense of uh, our accidents of birth, that doesn't preclude it um, from, from being knowledge. It would only preclude it from being knowledge if it involved some serious epistemic luck. Earlier, if we remember our elderly man who had the wind chimes, well, his belief was epistemically lucky when he had a hallucination and the wind just happened to be blowing or that Manchester United lost. It was just, I think, a matter of happenstance in that case. So I think we, we can respond to, to that objection this way. And I think this objection is, is, a, um, is a successful one. Yeah, you know, and I guess, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, fine. So I am privileged to not have been born in Nazi Germany, you know, uh, during the early first half of the 20th century. Others yeah. weren't so privileged. And I guess being born into that environment played an additional factor in, um, in prodding them into embracing Nazism. But that does not mean that I'm not warranted in condemning Nazis and condemning Nazism, right? Because I mean, you know, geography um, is not the only relevant factor that would that would that you know that would play a role in influencing you know the positions uh, that you do adopt. And I think the second thing here is that, and, and I think you just you know mentioned it in the second paragraph here, is that you know at the end of the day, someone like John Hick would have to go further and positively disprove that a certain theological creed is impossible, namely that God so decided to um, have a chosen people that he, reve that he sent prophets to, sent messengers to, and commands them and tests them to spread his message to the rest of the world, while the rest of the world's test would be being receptive to that message. So that's a belief. That is a theological belief that would um, pretty much fit into this scenario whereby there is a privileged geography or peoples that receive the revelation, but they will still be trialed and tested in spreading it. Um, and therefore, how, unless someone like Hick could demonstrate that that is impossible um, uh, and unbefitting of God and his attributes. Uh, the, the argument is not sufficient. So, yeah, a hundred percent. Now, this uh, response could raise a problem for epistemological externalism more generally, but I'm, I'm not going to go into this now. Yeah. Um, for those who know what I'm talking about and they know uh, this objection from an epistemologist called Lawrence Bonjour, then I want to say to that person if they know that Norman, the person in the example, Will have a defeater, but a Muslim in this case will not have a de defeater um, for thinking that that God exists. Um, so I'm just going to leave that there for those who know. Sure. Okay, so I think that yeah, what we've said here um, is is sufficient by way of a response to this argument from the contingency of religious belief. Now. Of course, um, I've been focusing here on knowledge. So I've suggested that, you know, if somebody is born in a particular place, but they're possessed with the right sort of faculty and stuff, um, given a few of the conditions, then, you know, they can still know that their belief is true. They can still possess knowledge rather. But what happens when somebody becomes aware of other people having, um, different religious beliefs and perhaps those individuals are sort of similar to you in a sense that they're probably as intellectually virtuous and honest and truthful and truth seeking. Um, I think this is where the problem, um, the major problem for reform epistemology really sort of I think it hinges on this. So call this the argument from religious disagreement. Uh, I think the argument can be spelled out in different ways. Here is one of the ways in which it can be spelled out. This is taken from um, a recent um, chapter in a forthcoming, forthcoming book. Um, so there are, there are four aspects to this argument. 
Um, the first premise here and the second being the most important. So suppose somebody reasons in the following way. There are many people whose beliefs about religious matters are incompatible with mine, yet whose epistemic qualifications are on a par with mine. So there are many people whose beliefs about religious matters are incompatible with mine. Fine, if we take the example of the Muslim theist, they can recognize that there are Christians and Jews and Hindus and Buddhists and Sikhs, and many others who hold beliefs that are incompatible with theirs. Say um, that, that Jesus is, uh, was incarnated, uh, God incarnated in the form of Jesus or something. So um, they can also perhaps, at least prima facie, think that there are people who are on an epistemic power with them in the sense that there are people out there um, let's just use the example of Christians who have similar epistemic qualifications, by which I mean that they're um, sensitive to evidence, that they're truth-seeking, that they're sincere and that they're honest in their intellectual pursuits. So let's so call it, it this... Doesn't, it doesn't mean that we believe that their arguments are as strong as ours. It just means no. that I can understand that there are Christians out there who have their own scholars, who have their own apologists, and they form their arguments, and who I, you know, I, I could understand that they think they have arguments for their faith. And it, yeah, definitely. I kind of and, appreciate and, that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I also think that this is just how the argument is being formulated. A oh, Muslim yeah. might deny yeah. that they have their epistemic qualifications are on a path, and mm. we'll see how that might go. Okay. Now, Call this first premise collectively the, the idea of incompatibility and uh, the epistemic qualifications being on a part our RD evidence, our evidence say, against our own beliefs from religious disagreement. So, this on the basis of this RD evidence against the total backdrop of, of my other evidence, against the backdrop of my total other evidence, I should say, and we'll get to what that means in a moment, but for now, just think about it as all the evidence we have for thinking our belief is true and all the evidence we have for thinking we've been reliable in assessing it, that RD evidence taken with that other evidence we have speaks against our own beliefs on religious matters. So then if premises one and two are true, then I should weaken or abandon my own beliefs on religious matters. Perhaps I should weaken meaning Perhaps I should just suspend judgment and say, you know what, I don't know anymore. Perhaps I should say, well, I, I, I suppose I, I do believe, but I'm not 100% sure. Or perhaps one should just almost deny it completely. Therefore, I should, we cannot even abandon my own beliefs about religious matters. Now, this formulation of the argument is one um, put together by Catherine Dormandy in her chapter Religious Disagreement in the forthcoming Cambridge Handbook of Religious Epistemology. I'm quite uh, privileged to have co-authored a chapter in that book as well on Islamic religious epistemology, which you might want to refer to. Um, but you can also check out this paper that she's written on, I think, on her website, even though the book's not quite out yet. But this is the argument she formulates. So what can we say about it? How does it impact um, you know, the Taimian approach uh, and so forth. So in order to respond to this kind of objection, or rather to put it another way, in order to remain steadfast in any situation where you have a disagreement with somebody who you might call your epistemic peer or your, you know, intellectual um, you know, colleague or something, um, you, you, you're either going to have your belief defeated, okay, or you're going to have to demote them. You're going to have to say that they're not really my epistemic peer in some sense. So in order to remain steadfast, you need to demote them or you're going to be defeated. Now, the relevant evidence pertaining to de being defeated or being demoted, sorry, being defeated or demoting them is of three kinds. One, P evidence, 
two are P evidence, and three are not P evidence. So P evidence is just the evidence you have for the truth of the proposition, okay? So for instance, a proposition like that God exists or that Islam is true. Of course, in the context of uh, disagreement, somebody's saying Islam is true and somebody's saying that it's not. So the disputed claim is that Islam is true. P evidence just means the evidence you have for thinking it's true. The RP evidence, okay, is the evidence you have that you have formed the belief reliably, that you have been reliable in your assessment of the evidence, in your gathering of the facts and information. You have not been biased, misleading, or something. It's evidence that you've been reliable in coming to that belief. Then the third okay, type. So, yeah, so yeah, this is that. So let's just to, so that we can use this, uh, you know, just to, uh, uh, apply it to a real life example. So well, let's I'm going to give I'm going to yeah. give three real life examples. OK, very know. good. OK, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. OK, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. Um, um, so that the, that's the RP evidence. And then the R not P evidence is the evidence you have for thinking that your epistemic peer formed their belief for life. OK, so your evidence you have for thinking it's true. You've got evidence um, for thinking you've been reliable. And then you've got evidence for thinking that your epistemic peer has been reliable in them coming to the contrary belief. OK, so how do we remain steadfast or how do we get defeated? What's going to happen to remain steadfast is that our P evidence and our RP evidence has to be slightly better than our, our not P evidence. And to be defeated, it'll be where the R not P evidence is on a par with the other evidence, basically. And again, I'm gonna give you some, some, some examples. And this uh, formulation is, is from the following paper by Michael Bergman. Finally, though, I have to bring in this other slightly technical distinction, I'm sorry. Um, but it's, it's about rationality. Now, earlier, uh, Bassam, we already sort of, you know, brought in to the discussion the notion of a defeater, right, being defeated. But to be very precise, what we mean by a uh, defeater is something called a rationality de a defeater. So that basically when you have a defeater, um, it means that you're, say, being rational or acting contrary to your epistemic duties or not being within reason to continue to hold your belief anymore, okay? And you need some level of rationality to have knowledge. So this is why I said that if somebody's conjuring up an argument in, the, in a basement in Australia, that won't be a defeater because it won't impact my rationality because I don't even know about it. I don't even have that evidence. So a defeater is something that impacts our rationality, our, say, um, not flouting any duties and being within reason when we hold a belief. And it could differ from person to person. Yeah, it could differ from person to person. Absolutely. Um, you know, somebody who has really strong evidence for God's existence will not likely be moved by a defeater or or not to be moved by a kind of defeater against religious belief compared to somebody who has very little evidence because of some circumstances, you know, they haven't thought about it or something. So, however, we need to make a slight distinction between what's called external rationality and internal rationality. So, um, external rationality means that everything is properly functioning, working as it should prior to our evidence, our seeming, our experience. Internal rationality means everything's functioning as it should in response to our experience. Now, Plantinga used the phrase, who originally came with the distinction upstream and, and downstream, but I think that's a bit confusing. So ex to be externally rational 
It just means that the, the cognitive faculties that have produced your belief, they're not malfunctioning. Okay. Internal rationality means that your response to the experience you have is a proper one, that the faculties are responding properly given the experience. So let's just use an example. Do you remember our elderly fellow with the wind chimes again? Well, he was not externally rational when he formed the belief that the wind was blowing because his cognitive faculties were not working properly. But he was internally rational in believing the wind was blowing because he had this real experience that the wind's blowing. So his response to his experience, you know, isn't suspect. Yeah, and he didn't know there was an external malfunction. Exactly. So he's internally rational, but mm. he's not externally rational. Mm. By his lights from within, mm. he's rational. But suppose somebody sees a tree, okay, and the fact is externally are kind of working in order, but then in response to the appearance of a tree, they form the belief that there is a man in front of them. Mm. Clearly, that wouldn't be an internally rational response to their experience. Mm. They would be eternally irrational. But suppose also somebody has really strong reasons to think something is not the case. So suppose that you go to a factory and um, you've been shown around this factory, different parts of it, and there's a conveyor belt in the factory. And on the conveyor belt, there are these little widgets, okay? And these little widgets, um, you know, you see them going along the conveyor belt. Now, the guy in charge of the, uh, the conveyor belt he tells you that these widgets on the line, on the conveyor line or the belt, are being irradiated by infrared light. Okay. And these widgets appear to you then as red. Okay. You, you already knew that they look red because you, you saw them, but he, he's telling you they're being irradiated by the infrared light. So first you had a belief that the widgets are red. Okay. The actual widgets are red. But then this guy's telling you that a special light shining on them that makes them look red. So then you wonder, hmm, I wonder, are they actually red? And then you ask your co-work, uh, one of the co-workers, and you say to him, are those widgets really red? And he says, no, no, they're black, but they're just, they just look red under this specific lighting. Well, that undercuts your reason for taking them to be red, which was your experience of seeming that they are red. Now, suppose... Uh, Balsam, I, I, we say that, no, I really, really just believe they're red. I just want them to be red, you know, um, despite the fact that I've been told that they're irritated by infrared light and that they're actually black. I just really super believe that they're red. You would be internally irrational. You wouldn't be responding to the evidence in a rational way. Yeah. Okay. So, what a defeater tries to do is it tries to take away someone's internal rationality. Given your awareness of religious disagreement, you are not internally rational in continuing to hold your religious beliefs in the exclusive way. That's what Hick is saying. That's, that's what Hick's saying, exactly. Um, that in distinction is important because we're going to use it in a moment. But let's just bring this... like to really um, hone in on this idea of how we can sort of uh, adjudicate whether one is defeated or one can demote or appear in a case of a disagreement. Let's just look at these three cases very quickly. So call the first case, the restaurant case. Suppose um, by some you go to uh, a restaurant and you have a nice meal with a friend. Um, you know, maybe you have Pepsi or, or, or Mendy or something. I don't know what you like. And, uh, and many other things. <laughs> Um, and at the end of the, um, you know, of the meal, um, you, you know, you're in a race to, uh, as is often the case in the Middle East, someone's in a race to pay for it all. Um, anyway, but suppose before that, you start to try to calculate the bill and, um, you, you, you know, you roughly know the prices of the, uh, of the, the bits and the things you'd had, the starters, the main course, the desserts, the coffee, the whatever. And you calculate it and you also factor in like a 10% tip and you want, you want to give a tip as well. Um, and suppose your friend's doing the same and, and, and after your calculation, you arrive at, okay, it's, 
I don't know how much. Just call it 50 pounds or whatever. She's used pounds. Uh, yeah. Um, and then, but your friend, your epistemic peer, let's call him, and I'll explain why in a minute, he comes to a different calculation of 48 pounds. Um, now, people think in this kind of context, you might be defeated because say your, your friend, um, he's as intellectually virtuous as you, he's higher educated, just like you are. You remember when you went to school together, he's quite good at maths, he was pretty good at maths. You might start to doubt now whether you've done it properly. And, um, and I, I think probably the right thing to do would be to, to check again or get out a calculator and, you know, just to double check, okay? You could twiddle a bit with the, the calculation such that you could make um, this disagreement more kind of puzzling or something. Um, it might be a bit odd to you that they came to 48 and you got 50. But, but, but anyway, be that as it may, a lot of people think in this circumstance, epistemologists, in the restaurant case, actually, you should suspend judgment temporarily on the price and you should go through it again and you should uh, maybe use a calculator and check. So in this case, U.S., your belief has been defeated, okay? At least defeated in the sense that you should suspend, um, you should have less confidence and you should maybe suspend judgment. What about another example? We'll call it the mass conference case. We've got two people, S1 and S2. And uh, this case is a bit different. Suppose we have a maths professor and he turns up for a conference and um, and he, he comes down from uh, from his hotel room um, and, he's, and he's getting ready to enter into the main hall where the conference is going to be held. And he sees a chap also coming down the stairs, probably coming out of his room. And, uh, and he, um, he looks like the sort of person that is a maths professor. I don't know how maths professors look, but, you know, he wears a certain suit. Maybe he has like algebraic symbols on his tie or <laughs> something like that. Um, and so you, you figure out that, oh, you know, he must be at the conference too. And, you know, he's heading into the hall where you are. And uh, you sat down and, and you start to have a chat and uh, you end up uh, getting onto some kind of maths uh, questions. And, uh, and it turns out that this person who you initially took as your epistemic peer because he looked like he was a maths professor at the conference, well, it turns out that, uh, you know, he, he can't even do some very basic and elementary maths, you know, throughout the questions that you, you, you're having in the, in the discussion. And so you figure out that, that this guy clearly is not your epistemic peer. And, and what you do, of course, is, you know, you, you look at the R, R not P evidence and, you know, the R not P evidence is the evidence that your peer has formed their belief reliably. And, you know, you start to but figure wh out. Why don't, why don't we look at his P evidence as well? Like well, his evidence, like why, why, why are we looking at our P evidence and our RP evidence, but not looking at his P evidence here? Good question. One could, one could say two things. One could say, well, you know, the RP evidence is our taking into consideration um, the evidence at hand in the sense, the same evidence. For example, um, we'll look at that in a minute. We could lay out both forms of evidence. We could lay out like all our evidence and somebody lays out all their evidence. And so they're, they're aware of our evidence and we're aware of their evidence. So we could do that. But the reason why we focus on our not P evidence is because we're interested ultimately in considering whether the fact, the mere fact that they disagree with us undercuts our belief. You get me? We're not trying to say that, oh, this argument and this piece of evidence undercuts our belief, because that would be a different kind of defeater. Suppose that the evidence, or some includes, say it's God's existence, the evidence includes Oh, the problem of evil and all that kind of stuff. Well, now actually the defeater comes from the problem of evil. It's not coming from the disagreement. The, 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 the argument from religious disagreement is that because someone who is as virtuous as you disagrees by that fact alone, you get a defeater. Mm. You get me? Mm. So, um, so that's why we're interested in the extent to which mm. we think they have actually been reliable in their assessment 
yeah. of the relevant evidence. And so in our case, we think that there's something untoward about our friend here because clearly, um, you know, he's not my peer. He can't even do basic maths. So when we got onto a particular question or equation and he came with up with a really wacky answer, that didn't change uh, my situation. Uh, I didn't get a defeat today, if, you know, you're the professor. Yeah. Finally, this one is really quite important in a sense, is a jury case example. Suppose we have somebody who has been accused of committing a crime and the jury basically have assessed the evidence that they have, the publicly accessible evidence, and they deem the guy to be guilty. But the person in question, he himself has a specific, a specific memory of, he knows for a fact, he just wasn't there when the crime was, at the scene when the crime was committed. He remembers where he was. He wasn't there. And so one might think that he's in a position because of his very strong uh, memory and you know the evidence from his memory, that his P evidence and our P evidence can even outweigh the assessment of the publicly accessible evidence that the jury have. And they don't have access to his memory, right? So that's the thing. So in that case, we might think he might be able to suggest the P evidence, his evidence from his memory, and his evidence that, you know, it just seems so reliable to him, actually outweighs the R not P evidence in this situation. Um, so he would demote the jury. In this case, we saw that we could demote our friend who turns up for the conference. And in the restaurant case, we would think that our beliefs defeated because these things, one and two and three, are on a path. Okay? Mm. So now, yes, yeah, sorry, you wanted to... Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I, mean, I mean, I did want to press a little bit simply because, I mean, I've had Muslims... Please press. Uh, I, I've had Muslims um, telling me uh, you know, but I, I've gotten like literally hundreds of questions over the years, but some of them, they have doubts when they see a very intelligent and seemingly sincere non-Muslim. But just the fact that this person exists bothers them, threatens them. They would like it to be the case that they can easily observe that anyone who is not a Muslim appears to be misinformed, appears to be insincere, appears to be arrogant or whatever. But the fact when they see someone who he seems humble, seems very intelligent, seems to be well informed, comes across as put, as putting forth what seems to be strong and factually based arguments. That the mere existence of this individual threatens them. So they feel that they cannot demote him in that sense. Yeah, uh, yeah, and you know, and what I try to tell them is that look, at the end of the day, you know, is he feeling the same way about you, <laughs> right? Um, you know, uh, I mean, we also have there. There are also intelligent, humble people who agree with you too, right? So it should just balance yeah. out. It should just offset the, the the whatever impact you feel that this person's existence has upon you. And you know, why isn't he feeling the same way about you and the uh, other intelligent Muslims? Right, for example. So, um, but yeah, what to do if you can't easily demote this person? And you, yeah, no, I think that's interesting. I, I suppose that um, what rationality requires when a defeater occurs is that when, you, when a defeater is acquired, one um, ought to suspend judgment or ought to reduce their level of confidence. I think in those cases that you're saying, the mere fact that they do have a decreasing confidence doesn't suggest to me that rationally they ought to have decreased their confidence. Um, you know, like in the restaurant case, when your friend who you know is good at maths, at least just as good as you, comes up with a different calculation, the idea that to remain rational, you ought to suspend your judgment on what the price of the check is now. Um, I think in the case that you're suggesting, the mere fact that there are these other sincere individuals um, 
as I'm going to point out on the next slide in particular, I don't think that means that you ought to reduce your confidence rationally, even if psychologically it just so happens that you do. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, basically we want to apply the this notion of P, RP and R not P evidence and the kind of cases that we've been looking at here to um, a case of religious disagreement. And of course, we are going to be thinking about religious disagreement of a particular kind, and that is the religious disagreement of a reformed epistemologist, in the sense that, well, not a reformed epistemologist, rather, somebody kind of adopts the, the reformed epistemological approach. In other words, they don't have arguments, okay? And that's going to be central. Um, so the pieces of the puzzle are just to basically put two people like that are a parallel. You've got two people, subject one, it's called S1, S2, two propositions, P1, P2, two outlooks, O1, O2, and two theories of error, TE1 and TE2. Put these people side by side in your mind. So we've got one person. Suppose that person and that other person are on a par in the sense that they're both uh, smart people, intelligent, sophisticated, adults, theists. They um, are both truth-seeking, in a sense, and sincere, in a sense, and, and, and honest, in a sense. Now, these two individuals form two different outlooks about the world. Outlook one and outlook two, call it Islam and Christianity, right? O one is Islam and O two is Christianity. So our subject here is a Muslim theist and a Christian theist. Let's just use those example, that example. And they have form, uh, they formed a, a belief that's at odds with one another. So consider proposition one being that, say, Christ is a prophet and messenger of God only. And proposition two, that Christ is God incarnate. OK. And they also have theories of error. What that means is a way of explaining why it might be that their friend here has formed a false belief. OK. You know, we can imagine that the Muslim already I'm kind of hinting at what they could say, but they would imagine that the Fitri <laughs> disposition is not intact. OK, in the way that it ought to be. And I'm sure the Christian might say that, you know, our sin and the lack of the Holy Spirit being in us is causing us sorts of problems. And of course, we have this distinction here between uh, internal and external rationality as well, which um, we'll look at. Uh, again, this is laid out by Michael Bergman. Ooh, this is a big... Uh, <laughs> A big section. I'm sorry that it, it looks kind of, don't look very nice, but I really like this and I'm quite proud of myself that I found this uh, this passage in uh, Muhammad Asad's book, The Road to Mecca. And, you know, it's interesting when you read, say, novels, be them like fictional or kind of an autobiography like this, you can find something that has like some philosophical application. And, and this actually does. Now, before you get entangled with this quote, uh, I want you to focus on this conclusions of reflection thing here. Because um, notice that I said we're dealing with somebody who believes, say, Islam is true and obviously believes that Jesus was a prophet, not on the basis of argument, okay? But that doesn't mean they haven't formed that belief on the basis of any reflection, right? So we're not suggesting that one day that they were sat in the chair and they were just zapped into believing Islam, just zapped into believing things about Prophet and about Jesus Christ. Clearly, that's not what that's not uh, that is not what goes on uh, when one forms religious beliefs, even if it's not based on argument. What happens often, and we're going to suggest this is what's happening here, is that somebody forms a belief on the basis of a conclusion of reflection. So suppose somebody reflects on the cosmos, 
reflects on the beauty of nature, its apparent orderliness, and um, they reflect on their sense of moral conscience and intuition. Okay, and of course that relates to them forming beliefs that, about God that God exists. Suppose they also um, reflect on their experiences in their life, just their senses that that of um, meaning and value. That there seems to be this scenario where their life is not just a random series of events, but it has some plan and purpose behind it. Suppose that they um, reflect on past memories with certain people that have told them sort of profound things um, that have given them a sense of the divine working in their lives. Suppose that they also read the life of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They read the life of the prophet. And suppose that they um, they find themselves reading the Quran. And, you know, so after all this reflection, they just find themselves with this sense. It's just Islam seems to be true. Now, it's not the case that they've inferred from things the Prophet said or did, or things the Quran say, or things about the world, and have connected these together in propositional terms and has formed the belief on the basis of this big, long inference that Islam is true. Rather, this belief has emerged gradually on the basis of reflection, but is fundamentally a basic belief because it's not based on argument or inference. This notion of conclusion of reflection comes from an epistemologist called Robert Audi in his book, The Good and the Right. He introduces it. Um, and Michael Bergman draws on it also in his article referenced uh, above. Now, this is a quote from Muhammad Asad in his book, The Road to Mecca. I would definitely recommend anybody to read it, not for the quote alone, but um, Muhammad Asad seems to have reached the belief that Islam is true, I think, in a way akin to a conclusion of reflection. And this is what he says. He says, an integrated Im image of Islam was now emerging with a finality, a decisiveness that sometimes astounded me. It was taking shape by a process that could almost be described as a kind of mental osmosis. That is, without any conscious effort on my part to piece together and systematize the many fragments of knowledge that had come, that had come my way during the past four years. I saw before me something like a perfect work of architecture, with all its elements harmoniously conceived to complement and support each other, with nothing superfluous and nothing lacking, a balance and composure which gave one the feeling that everything in the outlook and postulates of Islam was in its proper place. It seems to me Muhammad Asad, and I'm going to use him as our Muslim theist here, has formed a belief about Islam based on all his experiences, interactions with Muslims in the Muslim world, his, his witnessing of people praying, his considerations of the life of the Prophet and all these different pieces. And all of a sudden, in this process he, that you know, he suggests could be described as a kind of mental osmosis, he just finds himself believing and that Islam is true. Now, it's a seeming, it's a feeling, um, but it's not totally divorced from evidence in one sense but nor is it I nor is it an argument either so let's call this the relevant P evidence for a Muslim theist okay um, what's the relevant RP evidence the relevant evidence Muhammad Asad let's use him might have for thinking that you know he's been reliable well you know it seems to him that he's been sincere and He's been truth seeking. He genuinely wanted to see whether Islam is true. He made bold moves to leave Judaism and to consider Christianity. And, you know, he traveled the Muslim world and he's considered various bits and pieces on his journey. And he's found himself with this belief that by his lights, you know, he's been rational and, and, and quite reliable in the way he's found it. What is the relevant evidence, though, that Muhammad Asad might have if we bring 
a Christian theist onto the scene. S2, P2, or 2, and TE2. Now, a Christian theist, you know, maybe they could reason in a similar way to Muhammad I said or something um, about their own beliefs. Maybe they think strongly they have the evidence. Maybe they think strongly they've got happy evidence. But what is Muhammad Assad's are not P Evans. Well, if we have a Muslim theist, uh, sorry, a Christian theist who's as smart and intellectually virtuous as him, he might think that their general epistemic credentials are, are on a path. Uh, but he might, uh, and he might, sorry, he might also think that they have some similar internal markers. Internal markers about, are about the way things seem and feel to us about the kind of evidence um, that we have accessible to, to us in our mind and our memories. Um, he might think that they have some similar internal markers as well, although it's difficult um, to think that his internal markers of the truth of Islam are the same internal markers of the truth of Christianity because he's only in his own head. He can't get into somebody else's head. But Muhammad Assad, given his P evidence and RP evidence, which pertain to his belief in Islam, will also include a theory of error, right, as we suggested, that the Christian in his case, in this case, has formed their belief about the truth of Christianity in an unreliable way. The reason that they've been unreliable is because um, they haven't essentially got their fitri theistic disposition in working order. Um, when Muhammad Asad came to accept Islam on the basis of his P evidence and RP evidence that he thinks about, he has good reason for Islam, for thinking Islam is true, and he also has good reason for thinking that people who disagree with him probably lack the kind of reliable skill that he has been privileged with when he accepted the truth of Islam. So he's not likely to think that the evidence that the um, Christian has been reliable outweighs his own evidence, P evidence and RP evidence. Now, he would suggest that there are not P evidence, his are not P evidence isn't that strong, not because he thinks the Christian is being internally irrational. Maybe the Christian really does have these profound apprehensions or apparitions of the Holy Spirit or whatever they think. Maybe they do. But those particular apparitions have not been produced by um, a very uh, sort of skillful, truth-aimed, reliable faculty. And so he would think that they're externally irrational, even though they're internally rational, maybe. Now, of course, in a sense, this response to remaining steadfast to many people might not look that convincing because, you know, at the end of the day, you can imagine that a Christian theist could do the same thing. They could do the same thing, but anybody can do anything. I mean, within limits. You know, if somebody can claim Islam is true, yeah, and somebody can claim Islam is not true, that's just the way it works. But if the, RP, if the, if the P evidence and the relevant RP evidence is, by his lights, stronger, um, given all of these considerations, then I think that he would be rational uh, in demoting the Christian theist. Now, with this in mind, okay, if somebody's not convinced, right? Say, Basam, you're not you're not convinced with my response. Okay, what that might mean is that I am a steadfaster when it comes to uh, epistemology of disagreement. I believe in the steadfast view. Okay, but you uphold something called um, conciliate conciliationism. Conciliationism and conciliationists believe that in a situation like this one, okay, 
Muhammad Assad and his Christian peer should suspend judgment, right? The steadfaster says no, because the relevant P evidence, the relevant RP evidence by his lights outweighs his R not P evidence. But the person who upholds a conciliatory position wants to say, actually, because both can use the same kind of tactics, you've got to suspend judgment. But then notice something. Me and you disagree with what the right thing to do is in a case of disagreement. I think you can say said fast. You think that I should suspend judgment, right? So we have a disagreement. And suppose me and you are epistemic peers. Well, one, and then what does that mean? Well, it means the following, that somebody who thinks you should, so, uh, should suspend judgment is saying, if someone who's your epistemic peer disagrees with you, then you should both withhold your judgment. Right? But that's a problem because if I'm your epistemic peer and I think the thing to do is be steadfast and you think the thing to do is suspend judgment, you should suspend judgment on thinking that the right thing to do is suspending judgment. You get me? So upholding the withholding principle with respect to this disagreement might just mean that you're being irrational now because you're going to have to suspend your judgment in thinking the withholding principle is true. Many top philosophers, Thomas Kelly, for example, Michael Bergman, just to name a couple of steadfast epistemologists, reject this principle. So by your lights, you should reject it too. Okay? So that's what I think someone could say uh, with regard to disagreement. I think that they were just going to have to do their best to assess the P evidence and R not and the RP evidence and the R not P evidence. And I think for the, for the Muslim theist who forms a belief not on the basis of argument, but conclusions of reflection, that they, they can make this kind of move by demoting their, uh, their rival, let's say their uh, epistemic peer, by saying that they're not externally rational. There's something uh, not quite right. Maybe they're in the wrong environment. Maybe you need to be in the right kind of Muslim community to truly appreciate the evidence of Islam. Maybe um, your, your, your fitri disposition doesn't work very well in other environments. Etc. So two more things, two more objections, um, and and you know, and then I think we're almost done. Um, we can get through this one quite quickly. So this is an argument against holding religious belief in a basic way um, from Stephen Law, although he's not the first to come up with this argument. He calls it the X claim argument. Um, anyway, um, he basically draws on findings in um, cognitive science. Uh, specifically cognitive science of religion. Now, cognitive science of religion suggests that, number one, our, we have certain natural cognitive faculties which prime us um, toward accepting theism. And these faculties are called the hyper-agency detection device, coupled with something called a theory of mind. So the idea is that when we were in a more primitive state as humans, um, and we were living in the wild and we're in a kind of hunter-gathering context, we needed to look out for predators that might basically harm us. And so we developed this agency detection device, um, which in a sense is hypersensitive because if we were to hear a, a rustling in the bushes, we might uh, attribute to that sound um, that an agent is causing it, say an animal of some kind, so that we can defend ourselves and protect ourselves. And so we developed this agency detection device that was that is hypersensitive in some sense because it wants to keep us, um, you know, uh, safe. And we also developed a way based on our experiences to attribute to the agent uh, a kind of theory of mind that that maybe it's uh, like a conscious being with certain powers and certain abilities. And um, anyway, cognitive science of religion suggests that um, on the basis of these natural faculties that we developed, um, when we witness certain, um, certain things in nature that we can't necessarily explain naturalistically, it's not very easy for us to posit what kind of naturalistic thing could have caused it, say certain patterns um, or certain 
uh, you know, uh, events where we didn't witness the cause, um, we, we kind of, we end up forming supernatural beliefs that, that a God did it or something. Um, and so that's basically the idea. Now, what Stephen Law is saying is that, okay, cognitive science of religion says you have a natural faculty to, uh, to believe in something like God. Okay, and it's part of our, you know, natural cognitive um, framework as human beings. But the problem is, is that if you base your belief on this faculty, then you're going to have an undercutting defeater. Why? Because that same faculty has given us all sorts of uh, all sorts of contradictory beliefs. You know, he thinks it's given us beliefs about, I don't know, um, ghosts and ghoulies and demons or at the very least it's given us contradictory beliefs about the nature of god or it's given us beliefs that there's a rain god and a god of the sun and the wind and whatever else so what can we say to this well the reply to this is to say that what faculty do we use to think that another human being is an agent with thoughts feelings, desires, and a conscious mind like us. We use, according to cognitive science, the agency detection device. It's just the same faculty that we use when we're forming um, these beliefs about the divine. Okay, so if we suggest that this faculty is completely unreliable, you know, in, a, in, in an absolute sense per se, then the collateral damage of saying that would mean that we can't know that there are any other minds. Because if the faculty is completely unreliable, then it won't be able to give us sufficiently um, uh, beliefs that are sufficiently tightly connected to the truth about other people. It also suggests something even worse, that if our faculties of this sort are so unreliable, um, then it suggests our whole cognitive apparatus is unreliable such that even our belief in the existence of this faculty would be an unreliable belief. But um, someone could say this, though. Yes, but, you know, those are just beliefs about, say, other people. And, you know, with respect to those kind of things, it's reliable. And it's proven reliable because we all kind of agree that there are other people. But with respect to religious belief, then um, it's not reliable in that case. Somebody could say that. Well, I want to say if they, they say that, it's equivalent to saying that Islam itself is false. Because if Islam is true, as we've seen, that there are, there are certain circumstances and favorable conditions that it works well. You know, if you're in the right kind of environment and you've received the right kind of experiences, then it works well in those situations and it is reliable. The hadith tells us that it can be veiled, it can be maligned by social uh, circumstances. But if you're in the right situation, the hadith implies it's reliable. So I don't think that this um, is a really problematic argument. And is the spell really broken is an article in which the, uh, Justin Barrett spells out a response along these lines. So we've reached our final objection, and this is the objection uh, we call the argument from proper basicality. This argument goes like this, and this relates to something that we were talking about earlier. Um, proper basicality um, here is the idea that if you remember, we have basic beliefs and non-basic beliefs. If you have a belief that's basic, say that I see this laptop in front of me, and that belief is uh, produced by reliable faculties so that I can know it. We call it properly basic. So theistic beliefs are not properly basic, the argument suggests, because they are based on other beliefs we have, i.e. about concepts such as beauty, design, morality, God. Therefore, theistic belief is non-basic and must be based on an argument, even if it's a tacit argument, you know, we tacitly move to premises in our head uh, or it's just un unconscious. So 
the idea is that you say, you know, when we reflect on these signs that we're talking about earlier, you, you, you kind of laid it out, Basam, that, you know, we have these tacit moves that we're going from, you know, uh, the concept of design and beauty to a designer and we're going from designer to another belief we have about God being that designer. And so actually what's happening is, is that this is an inference. Well, I think that this is seriously mistaken um, because it just confused what inference is and what perception is, basically. So the first thing to say is that our perceptual faculties, say our faculty of sight and hearing, um, they are essentially information processes that give us information about the world. So right now, when I sort of survey my uh, physical environment, my perceptual faculties work to just give me loads and loads of information, like colors and shapes and forms and different, um, say, material objects being in the environment and the like. Now, when I process all that information, I'm not forming like a gazillion beliefs at one time. We don't, it doesn't work that way that our perceptual faculties give us beliefs per se. Say, um, you know, that if you prompt me and you, you, you prompt me to have a look in a certain place in my environment, like I could tell you that, oh, this curtain is slightly shorter than the other curtain, ever so slightly. When I survey the room, I actually form the information about that. I don't form a belief about it. When you prompt me, I can form the belief. But a belief is a particular propositional attitude. When I'm acquiring all this information about my environment, I'm not forming lots of propositional attitudes about lots of stuff. I'm disposed. I have the disposition to be able to do that if you prompt me. Okay? But... The way that our perception works psychologically and from the perspective of cognitive science is that it's not about per se forming beliefs. It's about giving us information which are not propositional attitudes. Beliefs are propositional attitudes. So reasoning, unlike perception, though, takes in beliefs as its input and further beliefs as its output. So perception is not the same as reasoning. Consider perceiving that there is God, perceiving um, a tree is not the same as inferring that there exists a God or a tree. Now, when I look into, a, into my garden, I perceive there to be a tree. Okay. As I suggested earlier, we don't move from it appears to me that there is a tree as the proposition that we have acquired to a further proposition that therefore there is a tree. No. Rather, we perceive there's a tree. However, as I pointed out earlier, that doesn't mean that the belief that there is a tree is not in any way connected to our beliefs. Clearly, in order to perceive a tree, you have to have acquired the concept of a tree, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to make that belief. So, what we can say is that basic beliefs are, in a sense, causally, they can be causally non-basic, but they're epistemically basic. So to try and, like, get our heads around this, um, there are some helpful examples. So uh, the tree example is just one example, but um, there's this really interesting experiment that I've seen a professor do with some students about perception. And uh, what you do is you say you put on the on, on the slide in the in the classroom like um different dots and um, if you look at these dots in a certain way you'll be able to see a figure in them like a horse or or maybe it's a dog or an animal or a person and there are a few different kinds and before the, the professor shows them this these dots they give them a script half of the classroom get one script and the other class get another script and one script might be about like a person and another script might be about, say, an animal, like, I don't know, a horse. And then when they flip open the slide to show the dots, what usually happens is the people that were handed the script about the man would see in the dots a man. The people that handed the scripts um, about a horse would see the horse. Now, so they have a perception that these dots look like a man or these dots look like a horse. Did they infer 
from the script that there is a horse. No, rather the script just acts as a kind of um, conceptual background that prompted them and enabled them to basically perceive um, either the horse or the man. Um, similarly, we could say that suppose somebody who is who's well trained in bird watching. Um, let's suppose that they've been doing it for a while. Um, what happens is that their perceptual faculties get attuned. They get attuned and they get trained through experience, so that when somebody who is a trained bird watcher hears a sound of a certain kind of bird, it perceives it immediately. Um, and if it sees a bird that has certain patterns, because it has the conceptual information about that bird, it perceives it immediately. So we can train and we can attune our uh, perception, but we don't actually make an inference on the basis um, of that, those particular propositions. It's just the concepts help attune the way that we, um, the way that we perceive the world. In other words, the act is like a filter basically for our perception and of course finally um you know if somebody wants to say well actually um you can't have an epistemically basic belief as we've already said oh well, this will run into problems but look if they want to say belief in god can't be epistemically basic why is a belief in a tree epistemically basic because a belief in a tree is using a concept that filters your perception. Perceiving God through apparent design is using the concept of God and design to help filter and perceive your perception. You can't really affirm one without affirming the other. And if you don't affirm either, you're left with an infinite regress. The final thing to say about this, um, or almost the final thing to say about this, is to actually hone in on what you said earlier, Basam, where you said, that maybe we, when we perceive these signs, we kind of like tacitly run through the premises. Somebody could just say, or a form of epistemology could just say, fine, no problem. Do you know why? Because all we're going to do is we're going to broaden our understanding of proper basicality to allow that. And what's going to happen is when you make this move tacitly, all we'll say is that you're moving from apparent beauty, apparent design to design it to God, that tacit inference triggers our quasi-perceptual faculty of God. Mm -hmm. So that tacit inference just triggers it. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that what makes the belief knowledge now is that that quasi-faculty is reliable, truth-aimed, irrelevant of the fact it's been triggered by that. So now it's epistemically basic because it's resting on this, the basic output of this quasi-perceptual faculty. Um, if somebody wants to say no, so that is to say, if somebody wants to um, say no, actually, it's not the case that we can have it where um, somebody goes through this tacit inference and that triggers this quasi-perceptual faculty, this uh, fifthly theistic disposition, which is a move I'm suggesting that the reformed epistemologists can make because, you know, I've already suggested that basic beliefs can be causally dependent on other beliefs in a sense, but not epistemically dependent upon them. So, um, you know, they could be happy to say that, all right, you know, when you do form this belief, about God through signs in nature, you move through a kind of tacit inference, but ultimately epistemically, because it triggers this perceptual faculty to give you a basic belief, that's what actually is doing the epistemic work. Now, if you want to say no and say it's the inference itself, i.e. just the argument, and you want to maintain that it absolutely is epistemically non-basic, I think you're going to have a problem. And the problem is, is roughly this. Let's call the position that the theistic belief is based on argument, inferentialism. So inferentialism holds that for a given ordinary believer, 
S. S is theistic belief will be epistemically appraised, appraised as justified or rational or knowledge, in inferential terms, i.e. as an argument would be. If S is theistic belief is epistemically appraised in inferential terms, and S will lack knowledge with respect to their theistic belief, is what I'm saying. But S does possess knowledge with respect to their theistic belief. Therefore, inferentialism is false. Now, why do I think premise two is true? Why do I think that if somebody's saying that the epistemic appraisal of somebody's theistic belief, not just somebody, let me clarify, an ordinary, non-sophisticated believer, if that is to be epistemically appraised in terms of an argument or inference, then that person will not know God exists, is my claim. Because consider the sorts of arguments that they would have. Like, it seems to me that the world is well designed, therefore God exists. That's not a very good argument. It seems to me that there must be a first cause, therefore God exists. One of the reasons why these are not good arguments is it doesn't follow necessarily. Just because the world seems designed doesn't even necessarily follow that it is designed. And just because it seems designed, it doesn't necessarily follow that God designed it. Okay, so that won't work. First cause, it seems that there's a first cause. Doesn't mean just because it seems that there actually is. And therefore concluding God exists is valid. It, all of this would be invalid. Sorry. So that's the problem. Now, let's try to change it, you know, be a bit more fair. Someone might say, oh, you're being unfair. Why are you picking all these bad arguments? Well, you know, that's probably what the ordinary believers got available, to be honest. Um, in fact, they might have even less strong arguments than this. They might just look at, you know, the, the beauty and splendor of the horizon on a, on a, on a summer's uh, evening and, uh, and just conclude God must have made all this. Um, that wouldn't follow. Now, the reason why I think this is because knowledge requires that our justification guarantees truth. Remember, um, suppose, okay, let me just give you a quick example, and, this, and then we're done with our examples. Supposing that somebody has a belief that, that someone's in the room right now, and it's a hallucination, and they, they, their belief... Um, it's true, though. Behind them, there is that same person. They believe John is in the room, okay? What's the basis? They're seeming that John's in the room, right? Because they have a hallucination. And John is behind them. Now, we would say that they lack knowledge. It was just lucky that John happened to be in the room, okay? They got it lucky because they had a hallucination, which is not hallucinations and not the sort of things that guarantee you truth. That's why we can't credit that person. Accurate perception in congenial environments that's reliable and true thing, that guarantees you a true belief. Now, suppose I flip a coin, and before the coin's flipped, I say, I know it's going to be heads, right? Um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to know in that case. Why? Because my evidence that it's going to be heads, the probability is just 0.5, the same as the probability it's going to be tails. So... He's having a kind of justification that gives you a 0.5 probability that the outcome is whatever you've concluded, that's not going to be good enough. Okay, so 0.5 probability is not good enough. Let's put it up a bit more. Suppose that there is an 8, uh, 0.8 probability that it's going to rain tomorrow. Um, suppose I work that out if I'm a weather forecast man or I just acquire that knowledge. Do I know it's going to rain tomorrow based on 0.8? I'm not sure you could say I know. Do I have good reasons and grounds for thinking it's going to rain? Yes. Do I know? I don't think so. You could make this even more difficult, but I, I mean, by adding in what's called the lottery paradox, but there's a way to kind of get around this. But suppose somebody does the lottery. They have a, say, 0.99. The probability of them not winning is so so high right but would we say that they know they're not going to win um 
even though they have such high, you know, odds that they're not, they're probably not. Does that mean uh, probability needs to be 100% to have knowledge? No, but that just kind of illustrates that the point here is that for arguments and evidence that of a non-basic kind, beliefs of a non-basic kind based on arguments to give you knowledge, they're going to have to probability the conclusion to a high degree. You see, if we have this inbuilt, inherently reliable in the right circumstances, faculty of perception, of memory, of reason, of introspection, we can know. And if we add to that a theistic one, we can know. If we depend on arguments alone, we will not have knowledge, is my view. So um, that would be the equivalent of saying that the ordinary believer just doesn't know Allah. And that seems counterintuitive to me. So that's it, really. In conclusion, uh, I want to make these points that I think that the Tamian view of religious epistemology offers one that can be well defended, given what we know from contemporary philosophy of religion. Of course, reformed epistemology itself is a view expounded by contemporary philosophers of religion. I think the view also hones in on, in, on our intuitions about epistemology that, um, that we can know just so long as our natural uh, fittity faculties are uh, working, and that it also hones, hones in on our intuition about the nature of religious belief, that for most people it's not formed an argument, but it's formed on the basis of the experience of, um, say, what someone takes to be God's signs in nature, and uh, in our case, the Qur'an. I also think it's interesting that this view on religious epistemology aligns well empirically with what we find in cognitive science of religion, I once came across um, an article that was saying, well, it's, ev it's evidently the case that we don't have some kind of faculty to know uh, that God exists and therefore it must be based on argument. Uh, that was someone who wants to defend the Kalam view. And, uh, but cognitive science of religion suggests otherwise. It suggests that this notion of fitra has some empirical um, backing of this notion of a fitri theistic disposition. And I think that you know, to some extent, to some great great extent, one might think that the view is able to withstand some challenges and objections to it. So, I mean, if anybody has any more objections or concerns, they can always contact me with this email address. But uh, yeah, Barakallahu fikum, Akhi Jamie, for that you know very rigorous and thought provoking presentation. I mean, you've certainly put on a uh, you know. Uh, 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 impressive and great defense of Ibn Taymiyyah's position for us today. And you certainly gave myself and our listeners much to think about and consider. And so, you know, thank you once again for this very informative uh, presentation. Um, you know, it, it, speaking to, you know, different brothers or uh, seeing other conversations about this, you know, so, uh, I guess, you know, so co some common questions pop up, right? And Mm -hmm. I think one the first one that pops up is, you know, how can one how can someone know or be justified in thinking that he's actually following his fitrah as opposed to some, you know, temporary or fleeting gut feeling, right? Like like how how can you or how can you know what that inner voice is? You know, is it a gut? Is it, you know, a temporary inner nudge to think something? Mm -hmm. Or is it actually that faculty that he's trying mm -hmm. to tap into? Um, I don't know. I, don't, I doubt that there is a 100% foolproof way of knowing. Uh, but surely there must be some things for a person to consider to self-introspect and ask himself, you know, or some boxes that he could tick to, to determine whether he is actually tapping into his filter or not. Yeah. Like, what are yeah. your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think that's a, a good question. Um, just as you sort of uh, got to the latter part of the question, I was thinking about um, in certain literature on religious experiences, uh, certain uh, thinkers have kind of come up with different criteria to assess whether a... Um, religious experience is veridical or not. 
Um, and, you know, some of that criteria might include, um, I mean, I'm not necessarily upholding the criteria. I'm just saying some of that criteria might include like um, following the experience. There has to be some kind of moral fruits, um, you know, uh, that someone's pushed towards actually serving God or something like that, um, that this experience shouldn't be at completely at odds with what reason upholds, i.e., you know, like a flat out contradiction or something. So there are different ways that people have tried to outline a criteria of radicality for experiences. So somebody could could consider that approach. I myself haven't given it too much thought, but there is this notion of a criterion of a criteria of radicality. But my response to that question more properly is to say, well, what, what is justification first and foremost? Because to know something, I mean, I think I've just really spelt it out that it is for the belief to be produced by a reliable and uh, truth aimed faculty. So to know that I know um, would just mean, again, it has to be produced by a faculty. I mean, the, your question is about a meta belief. I have a belief that Islam is true. And then I have a belief about whether my belief is true or not. How can I know that it's true, that, that belief I have? Well, just the same way as a non-meta belief, if it's produced by a reliable uh, sort of faculty. But I think the more interesting question is, how can I be justified? A justification, I take it to be um, more fully than what I outlined earlier, to be um, the idea of acting within one's intellectual rights. You're acting not contrary to some epistemic duty. So say you have a duty to be truth-seeking. You have a duty to consider the evidence. Uh, you might have a duty to respond to defeat as our objections. Um, and just genuinely being within your intellectual rights is what I take justification to mean. So it seems to me that if we look back at what we said about Muhammad Asad and you know his, his journey to Islamic faith and this P evidence, the evidence bearing on the proposition that Islam is true or something to do with Islam, then I think that, um, you know, what matters is that somebody has reflected and that they've considered, um, you know, that they have looked into what Islam happens to say and they might have also read um, what other religious traditions say. And after all that reflecting consideration, if it's still, if it seems to them obvious and evident that Islam is true, um, you know, I, I can't say that they're being unjustified um, in that sense of justification because, you know, they can't help having the belief. You know, they, they just find themselves believing that Islam is true based on all their consideration of things. Um, so I don't think they're flouting any epistemic duties. And so I think that that, that's, that sort of thing would be sufficient for a reflective person. I don't even think that, you know, like the old lady we talked about earlier, I don't think she needs that level of justification. Maybe she just needs to have this, the sense that God exists. I mean, if we have this, if we imagine like a lady in a medieval village in the Muslim world, you know, uh, she, if it just seems to her as it would do that, it stands true, then I think she'd be justified. She wouldn't be flouting any duties because to flout a duty, um, sorry, a duty, um, which is an art, implies can. Like you can't flout the duty if you're not able to fulfill it, right? And so I don't think she'd be in a position to fulfill like um, reflection on all these philosophical things. But somebody who does and reflects and still finds himself with this an Islamic belief, I think that they're within their rights to do that and they're justified. Right. You know, I, I think you know, you know, contemplating this topic, I think a lot of Muslims, you know, then ask what all this means for Dawa, you know, yeah. and where does argumentation, you know, the proofs from prophecy, the linguistic miracle of the Quran, et cetera, where, where does it fit into all of this? So how am I supposed to give Dawa to a Christian who so very strongly believes the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside him? And, and you quote, and, and you refer to Alvin Plantinga, who he himself is trying to justify that the Christian is rational in 
in in in listening to the Holy Spirit dwelling within. Uh, and you know, we can't ask the Christian to tap into his inner fitra. And if I offer him rational defeaters for his worldview, aren't we ultimately just putting on our evidentialist hats on here? I mean, I remember back in university, I was extremely frustrated with um, one of the student leaders of the Christian student club, the equivalent of an, S of an MSA. And I was having lunch with him one time and, and you know, I just told him, what would it take for you to leave your faith? And he's like, I'll absolutely never leave. I don't care. And he said it this crudely. I'm not caricaturing what he said, actually. Like, yeah. I, it's like, I, honestly, there's nothing you could say to me that can make me change my mind. I know that the Holy Spirit is within me, right? And for me, I guess I just find that frustrating. I think any Muslim who's giving da'wah would find that to be very frustrating because, you know, at that point, you would probably want that person to think like an evidentialist. But if you think that way, then you may come across as inconsistent if you yourself are a reformed epistemologist. And so I think this is probably the, the number one thing that probably troubles evidentialists with reformed ep epistemology. They're worried and they're concerned that this comes across uh, as Muslims, you know, applying double standards. Like we want the Christian to ignore that inner voice and to consider the evidence. While we are okay with our common folk Muslims, you know, um, ignoring arguments that may come their way uh, in response to that inner strong Fukhari feeling that Islam is true. And I guess it's, you know, how, what is the way around this? Mm -hmm. And I know you've touched upon this, but maybe if you could like, yeah, put the points into one, because I think this is, this is it. I think this is the main crux of the issue, and I think that this is the number one objection that people have to the stance. Yeah, I think this is, um, these are all really important points that you're making. Um, so where to start, really? I think that, you know, first and foremost, reformed epistemology is just the view, right, let's be clear. It's just the view that religious or theistic belief can be rational or warranted or a piece of knowledge without an argument. It can be, right, in principle, in theory. That's the thesis. Hmm. Now, that's not to say that for everybody, not having arguments will be sufficient, right? Hmm. Uh, reformed epistemologists won't be saying that. Number one, if somebody is in the midst of a defeater, okay, it might require that they have to have an argument to rebut the defeater, for example. It might be the case that somebody has an experience of God and an experience whilst reading the Qur'an, but that that experience due to um, certain reasons, maybe it's just the way that they've lived their lives, maybe they haven't been very, like, in their minds close to God, maybe they've got doubts and so on. Maybe for that person, they also need arguments to give them the kind of um, conviction um, that's required for knowledge. Because I also think to know something, it means that we have to hold something in a strong way. If we hold it in a loose way, we, we might fall out of, uh, of being attached to the truth. So arguments can help actually boost somebody's epistemic justification or warrant so they can be useful in that sense because I don't think everybody will necessarily um, possess knowledge without arguments. That's not the claim that everybody who believes in Islam without arguments knows Islam. It's just the claim that in principle they can and in certain favorable conditions they can. The other thing to say is that people who are just simply refusing to entertain the evidence right, like this fellow that you're suggesting, they are acting irrationally, internally irrationally. And um, I think knowledge requires that 
that kind of internal rationality. If knowledge is about things proper functioning, you know, faculties proper functioning, part of it functioning properly is that it functions properly in response to defeaters and to counter evidence. So I think that somebody who refuses in that way to even entertain it, um, they would be acting irrationally. And, you know, the reformed epistemologist should have no problem saying that. I also think that what you're suggesting here is important because what worries me as well about um, some individuals who adopt reformed epistemology or they like they use it as a kind of safety net and as a kind of get out of jail free card to sidestepping the evidence to such an extent that they can form these toxic echo chambers okay uh, such that they just don't allow the evidence to come in where they should so i think that um there is somebody called kelly james clark he's a student of plantinger and uh he wrote he wrote the article religious epistemology in the internet encyclopedia of philosophy and he suggests that the reformed epistemologists should adopt what he calls the rational stance the rational stance is one Trust the basic um, products of your faculties, deliverances of your faculties to begin with. Trust them that they're innocent until proven guilty. Two, seek supporting evidence. Look elsewhere for evidence that might confirm your belief. And three, be open to contrary evidence as well. And I think that anybody who adopts the reformed epistemology position can and should adopt the rational stance too. Trust the basic diligence of our faculties, seek supporting evidence, be open to contrary evidence. Somebody who doesn't adopt the rational stance, I think might be adopting the irrational stance. And therefore, you know, they, they might not, they, they want to have knowledge because I think knowledge requires a certain degree of rationality. Um, so those are a few things to consider. I don't know if there's anything else you want me to say that I maybe missed. Oh, that's great. Um... You, did, did, Ibn, did Ibn Taymiyyah recognize that an evidentialist approach might be required for certain people who just can't help themselves and, 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 and they demand philosophical arguments as evidence? Like they're, they're too sucked into the philosophical discourse and yeah. they can't help but demand these arguments. And they're just not, they're simply not convinced with this approach. Like, did he recognize that, okay, for some people, the evidentialist approach is probably required. I mean, uh, does he yeah. have any comment on this? Or Yeah, definitely. Um, he commented on a, th a few things related to this. I think, and both of them, from my mind, come from his Kisab uh, al uh, uh, um, Now, he has this idea that, yes, yeah, somebody who's delved into Karam uh, and engaged with that for some period, they've kind of attuned themselves um, and adjusted themselves to that kind of discourse such that, you know, just pointing out that their experience might be sufficient for them won't satisfy them, maybe, um, even at the epistemic level. And so they might actually need arguments mm -hmm. because they've been attuned and adjusted to that kind of way of thinking about God. The other thing is he actually says explicitly, I have this quote in, in various places from his Mujma al Fatawa, that somebody whose fitrah is corrupt in some sense, impaired in some sense, may need an argument mm. to revitalize it again. Mm. So that's another kind of person. The other thing that uh, Sheikh Islam Taymiyyah says is that, um, that basically that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made evidence of him like widespread in different ways so that there isn't necessarily one route, if you get me. And, mm. and he suggests like, somebody through um like in this fitri daruri kind of way they can know he suggests through like ilham or kind of spiritual really spiritual experience even through taqlid of a reliable person even through nadar so that there are a combination of ways and his problem with the mutakallim is that they've restricted the root or source to knowledge of god to just arguments 
if in Tamey wants to open it up. Fantastic, Jamie. Um, before we wrap this up, I mean, do you have any final words that you'd like to for our listeners with? Well, I mean, I just want to thank you for inviting me. And, in. you know, it's 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 been a lot of fun for me. I know that I've uh, gone on somewhat, perhaps more than I intended to. But, uh, yeah, I hope that it's stimulated the listeners uh, to some extent. And as I said, if anybody has further say, questions, objections, concerns, or whatever that might be, then they can simply email me at that email address on the screen there. And I'll be more than happy to, to get back to them. Jamie. That'll be a good note to, to, to end on. And I'm going to part you and our listeners with the Islamic farewell greetings of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.